What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so uh, Spider-Man Homecoming comes out in July. And after finishing The Incredible Hulk, a lot of people really seem to enjoy the idea of like long series, like picking a character, a team or something like that, and just doing like an entire run, just covering like when one writer takes over the title and just does like a whole run. You know, Greg Pak's Incredible Hulk is a really good example. It's also, also the reason why, uh, I think I'm gonna go ahead and dive into it, but it's also the reason why we're gonna do Jeff John's Green Lantern because it was it was so good. That's gonna take like a year and a half to finish. It's insane how long it is. Um, But that's also why we're doing Injustice is because, you know, they're really popular runs. People really enjoy them. I really enjoy them and so I figured I'd go ahead and cover them. But with Spider-Man Homecoming coming out in July, I intended to do all new, all different, amazing Spider-Man, you know, when, when Spider-Man Homecoming came out. But after, you know, the idea of people loving the Incredible Hulk so much, I sat down and I said, okay, well, the issue with Spider-Man, all new, all different, amazing Spider-Man is, is the fact that it's basically just a continuation of Dan Slott's run from when he first took over the title. It's all just one great, big, huge, giant story. And so because of that, I kind of figured, well, I mean, why not go back and do Dan Slott's run? Because it really starts with Spider-Man big time, you know, taking Peter Parker back to his roots the way he should be in the eyes of Dan Slott and really in the eyes of a lot of fans. And then basically moving forward all the way through the events of Spider Island, all the way through the events of Superior Spider-Man, Spider-Verse, all that kind of stuff. And then basically ending with all new, or really kind of picking up with all new, all different Amazing Spider-Man by the time the movie comes out. That's what I'm shooting for here. And the way I have it scheduled, it should work out. You know I mean? Coming out every Monday, it would just be a Spider-Man video running up until all new, all different Amazing Spider-Man uh, in July. But a couple of things that I want to run over here as we get into this is really J. Michael Straczynski's run. I don't want to go super in depth into it, but there are a few things that we need to highlight. Uh, first and foremost was One More Day. One More Day is one of the most divisive stories among Spider-Man fans. I mean, there are a lot of people that just hate it. They hate, hate, hate it. Usually it's because, you know, people who picked up Spider-Man before the events of One More Day. So they were reading about the marriage and the struggles and trials and tribulations between Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson. They came to identify with him. They loved the marriage between the two of them. I mean, Peter and Mary Jane Watson were never like Superman and Lois Lane level couple, but they were the most popular couple in Marvel comics. They were kind of like Marvel Marvel's power couple in a lot of different ways. There were a few people who just hopped on the bandwagon. They just hated One More Day because it was the popular thing to do. But if you were one of those people who, you know, went back and read Spider-Man before the events of One More Day and then went through One More Day and picked up after, a lot of people hated it. But after the events of, uh, of, of One More Day, there was Brand New Day. And Brand New Day basically said, here's the new starting point for Peter Parker. And people hated that just as much as they hated, uh, hated One More Day because it basically said now, you know, Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson are no longer married. They basically ended their marriage by selling it off more or less to Mephisto in order to make sure that Aunt May lived because of the fact that she was dying at the time. It was granting Aunt May a new lease on life. Now, with Brand New Day going forward, Straczynski made a lot of changes. One of the first things he did is he took the character of Aunt May and said, okay, she's been single and alone long enough. You know, ever since you know, Peter Parker was first introduced, Uncle Ben had died and she's basically been alone for the last 40 some odd years. Let's give her someone. And so what he did is he basically gave her, he paired her up with uh, J. Jonah Jameson Senior, the father of J. Jonah Jameson, the, you know, the head of Daily Bugle that hates Peter Parker. And so because of this, the two of them basically paired off fans. You know, there were fans who loved it, fans who hated it. It was kind of a, a mixed reaction. Uh, but then he, you know, J. Michael Straczynski also got rid of the Daily Bugle. And the way he did this was by interjecting stories of J. Jonah Jameson having heart attacks, different things like that. But it was basically the idea that the Daily Bugle had been struggling. And so what happened was a uh, financier, a guy by the name of Daniel Bennett, I think it was, uh, came along and basically bought it. Now it was done again against the will of J. Jonah Jameson. And in fact, he was hospitalized at the time that it actually happened. Instead, it was really J. Jonah Jameson's wife, Marla, who engineered the selling of the Daily Bugle. But essentially this, this more or less uh, led to everybody being sent off. I mean, it, it, you know, it was really people just not really being tied into the Daily Bugle. And so because of that, it was removed from the landscape in a lot of ways. But then we also had Peter Parker. Now, Peter Parker and J. Jonah Jameson, one of the cool things that Straczynski focused on was this notion that the two of them had this kind of respect. You know, J. Jonah Jameson always looked at Peter Parker as, as not really a surrogate, son, but somebody that he had a lot of respect for. The issue with this was that when Peter Parker revealed his identity during the events of Civil War, J. Jonah Jameson flipped. He hit the roof. And what it did is it shattered the trust that he had in Peter Parker. And it more or less, you know, created a vendetta stronger than it had ever been between, uh, between J. Jonah Jameson, Peter Parker, and Spider-Man. And so what happened is eventually Spider-Man basically saves the life of J. Jonah Jameson during an encounter with the Vulture. But a security guard had sacrificed his life in the process to, you know, try to protect, uh, Jameson. And while Jameson looked at the death of 
from the security guard and said that was honorable. That was a great thing that he did. Peter Parker doctored a photo to make it look like Jameson had fought off the vulture. And so what happened is uh, Jameson took this as an affront and said, basically, you're insulting the identity of the security guard. You're insulting the memory of the security guard who basically saved my life. And so Peter Parker was essentially ousted from the Daily Bugle. And so that's why he's currently unemployed when it comes to this. Now, there were a couple things that, that were introduced here and there, and we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But with regards to Spider-Man big time, this is really, again, Dan Slott making Peter Parker his own. Now, keep in mind, this is all after the events of Civil War, so on and so forth. You know, Steve Rogers has already returned to the landscape. And so what this does is it gives us the Avengers, the, really the mighty Avengers as it exists right now with Thor, Jessica Drew, Spider-Woman, you know, uh, Iron Man, Wolverine, Captain America, Hawkeye, so on and so forth. And they're basically responding to the robots of Dr. Octopus wreaking havoc in New York. Now, this is really Dan Slott leading up to the events of Superior Spider-Man when Otto Octavius took over the body of Peter Parker. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people loved the early run of Dan Slott because there were so many plot threads that started in big time and extended out into everything and it took, you know, four, five years in order for it to all come to fruition. But when it did, it felt rewarding. It felt like this great, big, huge, incredible experience. And so um, really with the various superheroes going through and, and fighting against, uh, you know, these, these guys, we pick up with J. Jonah Jameson and again with Marla. Now, of course, because of the trials and tribulations they'd experienced, they were going through couples counseling, different things like that. But again, it's really just Dan Slott saying, hey, here's where we reside. We have J. Jonah Jameson as mayor right now. Um, we have him and Marla dealing with, with family issues, you know, dealing with, with couple issues. It's again, you know, taking taking the stories very much back to the grounded level of traditional superheroes and traditional characters as we knew them, albeit in some slightly different roles. But what we do at this point is we pick up with, with Captain America. Now, within this story, uh, this is really just kind of a, a, not really a side plot, but kind of a, a side thing, but it really ties into Dr. Octopus. But this is a small version of what I'm talking about when I talk about, you know, instances where Dan Slott's building into bigger things, because this is not actually Steve Rogers. Instead, what happens is Steve Rogers tells this guy who's standing guard with regards to this Vertex shuttle to basically go away, you know, to say, hey, look, you're you're relieved of uh, relieved of guard duty. You know, I'm going to go ahead and take over here just because of the fact that this is one of the most important artifacts that we have right now. Not anyone can just keep an eye on it. Now, of course, the other cool thing here is Dan Slott builds on the legacy of Captain America. And that's one of the interesting things here is in Marvel Comics, you have characters that are interchangeable and you have characters that are concrete, characters that do not change. Uh, some characters that are interchangeable might be like Moon Knight, for example. Different writers can can take a different view of the character, write him differently, bring in characters, remove characters, things like that. Steve Rogers is not that way. He's a concrete character and he's always the guy who's like, freedom, freedom above all else. He always fights for freedom. He never fights for anything other than freedom. That's the biggest reason why the, the change of Steve Rogers becoming a Hydra agent during all new, all different Marvel was so, uh, so controversial is because there were a lot of people who were clinging on to these old stories and didn't want to see the, the Steve Rogers concept move forward, didn't really want to see it change. They wanted him to stay Captain America and rightfully so because people latch on to different aspects of different characters as, as time goes on. And the one that they love the most is the one they don't want to see change. So it's just, it's natural to have that kind of response. But again, picking back up with Peter Parker, that we basically joined Felicia, uh, joined with the arrival of Felicia Hardy. Now, she doesn't get a whole lot of, uh, of screen time here in the opening salvo for big time. She actually becomes important later on down the line. But again, you know, she's just one of the funny members, one of the, the members of the spider family, so to speak. But there's also a little banter back in here. And again, this is really just Dan Slott saying, hey, Felicia Hardy, she's one of the characters that you all know and love. She's definitely going to play a major role in the story. It's always it's always kind of fun to see. But the, the other the other funny thing here is she arrives on the scene to help Peter Parker, you know, bail him out of an otherwise dangerous situation. And she's like, yeah, so what's the chances of me becoming an Avenger? And Peter Parker, of course, is like, none. There's no chance of you becoming an Avenger. There's, there's not a single solitary chance. Sorry about your luck. <laughs> But again, from here, the cool thing, and one of the things that I love the most about Dan Slott's writing when it came to, to this opening, you know, this opening thing was really the idea of how Peter Parker sees himself. Because what he does is he sits down and he says, hey, look, you know, I basically have a, a new life going on now. You know, I'm I'm with my new girlfriend, you know, Carly Cooper. Uh, I'm not with Mary Jane Watson anymore. You know, he talks about the idea of Aunt May being in a relationship uh, with J. Jonah Jameson Sr. But he also addresses himself in relation to other superheroes. You know, he says he's not a heavy hitter like Thor. You know, he's not one of the big time geniuses like uh, Reed Richards or Tony Stark, but that's the irony of this, is that he very much is. You know, Peter Parker is extremely smart. He's one of the smartest men out there. And it's really this sort of humble nature that people that people like, you know, where he, he doesn't sit down and say, yeah, I'm one of the smartest people out there. You know, it's always the idea that in his mind, there's always someone smarter. There's always someone out there that's capable of more. But we as the reader know that that's not really the case, that Spider-Man is one of the smartest people out there. Now, at this point, 
we pick back up again with Andrew Air Force Base. And again, this is basically the chameleon who is masquerading as Steve Rogers. And the reason why is because they're basically carrying out a mission on behalf of Dr. Octopus. Now, again, this is Dr. Octopus setting the stage for some much grander plans uh, later on down the line. He's basically implementing his own scheme on the side. This entire conflict here is essentially designed to be a distraction. Not only that, you know, Dr. Octopus actually has a lot of respect for Peter Parker. And this is why I say this is Dan Slott setting the stage for Dr. Octopus taking over the mind of Peter Parker during Superior Spider-Man. Because what he says is, you know, at this moment right now, Peter Parker is really, really smart. But Dr. Octopus also recognizes that a time will come, or at least in this almost immediate moment, that Peter Parker is going to find a way to basically deactivate all these different bombs that he has planted inside these devices around New York. And this is why I say that Peter Parker is just as smart as Reed Richards and Tony Stark, because what he does is he sits down and says, oh my God, I figured out what's going on. Because in their mind, you know, in, in the mind of Reed Richards and, and Stark and so on, this countdown's going. And when it reaches zero, all these bombs are going to go off and New York is going to vanish off the face of the earth. But what Peter Parker realizes is that it's the first day of November that it's basically daylight savings time. And so, you know, Dr. Octavius or Dr. Octopus had taken this into account that when Peter Parker figured out what was going on, that he would be able to set the timer back and give them an extra hour. Now, this, of course, allows Peter Parker and the various members of the Avengers to get these bombs out of here. But again, this was all just designed to be a ruse. It was designed to keep them focused on this one thing so that Dr. Octopus could implement his own plans. And what we'll find out uh, with those plans will, will be later on. But from here, we transition to Frontline. Now, again, this is all part of the post-Civil War landscape. Remember, Frontline came to prominence with Ben Yurick and Sally Floyd during, uh, during Civil War. And it got a lot of popularity because it was basically covering the events of Civil War from the perspective of reporters, from non-superheroes, basically. And because of that, uh, Ben Yurick and Sally Floyd eventually left the Daily Bugle where they originally started out. They took the frontline concept with them, basically this online posting source, and they, they launched their own publication house called Frontline. And that's what's happening with a lot of people here. A lot of folks like Robbie Robertson, you know, they are all taking up residence as part of Frontline in place of the Daily Bugle. And so because of that, you know, we again uh, pick back up with, with Peter Parker. And the funny thing about this is, again, during Dan Slott's run, there was a girl named Michelle. And she had essentially become uh, Peter Parker's roommate to a degree. And they were they really had a relationship, although it was more of a physical one, really, than an actual, you know, we love each other on a, on a solid scale. But this just came by way of Michelle's brother, you know, uh, being convicted of a crime, you know, and her keeping an eye on her brother's place while he was gone. Peter Parker, of course, having been roommates with her brother before he was incarcerated. Uh, but this is, again, Dan Slott wrapping all these things up and, and axing all these things, removing them from the landscape. Because what happened is as Peter comes home and Michelle's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going back to Chicago now because my brother's out. And so, you know, that's that's pretty much it. And so Peter Parker is more or less just kind of left to call around to different people and see if he can find a roommate, see if he can find a place to take up residence. Now, that's the cool thing here is because this is Peter Parker just struggling with everyday things. He's like, well, my roommate's gone, so I got to find a new place. And he's got to do a quick, fast and in a hurry. Of course, he goes to Carly, but their relationship is still pretty new. And so she's like, look, I mean, we more or less just started dating not too long ago. I'm not really comfortable with moving in. And so she basically says, no. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of messed up. Of course, he goes to Flash Thompson and Flash Thompson's like, no, that's not going to happen, man. Like you, you're, you're not going to live with me. And he even goes to Mary Jane Watson. You know, and the funny thing about this is Dan Slott, it was, it was really kind of a funny moment because it was like Dan Slott was toying with fans. It's like he was trolling Mary Jane Watson fans. Like, Hey, you know how you guys really, really want to see Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson get back together? And fans are like, yeah. And he's like, well, that's not going to happen. And so like that, they, you know, he ends up having to leave. He ends up walking away, you know, when the two of them agree not to be roommates together. And so ultimately he goes to, uh, he goes to Aunt May. Now, the cool thing about this is that Aunt May was already spending time, uh, or at least already hanging out with the son of J. Jonah Jameson, along with J. Jonah Jameson Sr., you know, the two of them, uh, you know, spending spending time with one another hanging out, as well as a woman by the name of Dr. Madison Jameson. Now, the reason why Madison Jameson matters here is because Aunt May was telling her about Peter Parker, saying, hey, you know, my, my, you know, Peter Parker's a genius. You know, he's one of the smartest people on the face of the planet. And so by the time Peter Parker arrives, starts knocking on the door of Aunt May and says, hey, would it be possible for me to crash here, Dr. Madison says, actually, your Aunt May has basically said that you're a genius. And I know of a guy who's very good at dealing with geniuses. And so what happens is Peter Parker is taken to Horizon Labs. Now, for those of you guys who were reading all new, all different Amazing Spider-Man and the first story arc saw the marriage of Max Modell and his significant other, what this was, was a continuation of this whole Horizon Lab story. This is where all this starts, is this whole Horizon Labs thing. It's the introduction of this. We kind of get the kicker. And that's, that's why I really wanted to cover this. It's really exciting. You guys will basically get everything that led to all new, all different Amazing Spider-Man from the ground up. Like you guys get it from the very beginning, which is why it's so cool. But Horizon Labs, is, as it's led by Max Modell, is like Peter Parker's playground. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's the best way to describe it. Max Modell, according to Peter Parker, was really his idol in a lot of different ways. I mean, Peter looked to Reed Richards, he looked to Tony Stark. Yeah, they're really smart, they're capable of, of great things. But in his mind, Max Modell was the guy to aspire to. Not only that, we get the introduction of a really cool guy named uh, Grady, Grady Scraps. And I love Grady Scraps. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the gist of this is that Horizon Labs is essentially a think tank for some of the smartest people in the Marvel Universe. That's really all it is, is it just, it's a think tank for all these geniuses. And so it's a chance for them to just kind of run free and do whatever they want to. Now, what uh, what Max Modell says is that the way this is done or the way Horizon Labs functions is different than like Reed Richards' Future Foundation. It's different than like Tony Stark's whole initiative. The idea isn't to necessarily say, all right, guys, your assignment is to focus on this one thing and then go from there, it's basically, hey, do whatever you want to do. Like, just create whatever you want to create. Just get carried away, let your imagination run wild because creativity only really comes when there is no constraint here, when there's no you know confinement here. And so what ends up happening is we basically pick up with a woman named uh, Sajani Joffrey, who's basically trying to create an artificial version of Vibranium. Now, the reason why she's doing this is because this story takes place after an event called Doom War. And Doom War was a story where Dr. Doom invaded Wakanda for the purpose of capturing its Vibranium. Now, while well, you know, Wakanda, its citizens are basically placed under control. You know, they were dominated, that kind of thing. Black Panther and his sister Shuri were the only ones who remained out of the influence of this sphere of control. And so in the end, it was, you know, they were successful in casting out Dr. Doom. But in the process, Black Panther basically rendered all the vibranium across the world inert. And so this had two uh, two effects. The first is that every, all vibranium everywhere, which had the mystical property of, uh, of absorbing kinetic energy, uh, it basically rendered all that obsolete. And so now vibranium was essentially worthless. The other effect was that because vibranium was basically worthless, Wakanda had no real value anymore. And so what's happening is people are basically scrambling to try to find vibranium, trying to find a way to duplicate it. And that's really what's happening here. The issue is that Sajani's created something called reverbium. Instead of absorbing sound, instead of absorbing energy, it reflects it and it amplifies it. And so essentially it's like, it's like turning the whole thing into a tuning fork. And that's really what happens here. As soon as it's activated, it's just like infinite amplification of sound to the point that it threatens to bring the entire building crashing down around it. Now, of course, Peter Parker is able to uh, able to, to shut the system down. And so what happens is he's kind of given this pop quiz by Max Modell. The funny thing about this is that when they ask him questions like, well, you know, we've developed an anti-gravity harness. What do we use for a braking system? You know, when he's asked questions like, how do you contain a 3D object or a 2D object in a 3D space? You know, when they're talking about how did, you know, we've discovered some alien fungus, how do you, how do you slow its growth? He references his own experiences here. When he's dealing with Vulture, when he's dealing with, uh, with Venom, he's referencing his own experience and going against these various vi uh, villains and how he was able to defeat them. And so really it's him bringing his own experience to the table. And this is Dan Slott saying, no, 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 Peter Parker's a genius. He's one of the smartest people out there. And so from here, it's really Spider-Man hitting the big time. It's the idea that he's experienced, he's finally experiencing success. He's finally having things go his way. And so as this little bit begins to wrap up, we're basically uh, brought back, or at least we're reintroduced to the character of Roderick Kingsley, also known as the Hobgoblin. Now, the cool thing about the Hobgoblin is that he was actually created by Roger Stern to basically be a replacement for the Green Goblin. The way it worked out is in 1971, uh, Jerry Conway had written a story called The Night Gwen Stacy Died, and that was the death of Gwen Stacy. It was one of the most landmark stories in the history of Peter Parker, but basically it ended with the death of the Green Goblin. The issue was that Green Goblin was so popular by that point, or at least the idea of you know Gwen Stacy dying because of either the actions of the Green Goblin or Spider-Man was such a controversial topic that's still being debated to this day that Marvel wanted to bring the Green Goblin back. But at the time with Roger Stern writing Amazing Spider-Man, his idea was, I do not want to bring the Green Goblin back from the dead. Instead, I'm going to create somebody else and enter the Hobgoblin. Now, there have been different people who have played the role of Hobgoblin, and they've all had different uh, aspects of the character that made them all unique. But for the character of Ken, uh, Kingsley, and really for Hobgoblin as a whole, uh, while he has come into contact with Peter Parker on several occasions, he always really seemed more like a mercenary than anything else, you know, kind of like a, a soldier of fortune in the sense that he would just take contact contracts, he would implement those contracts and that would be it. Now, with regards to the Hobgoblin as he exists right now, he's been contracted by Kingpin. And the reason for this is because Kingpin, you know, has sources on the inside. There's guys on the inside of Horizon Labs. And Kingpin comes to the realization that, you know, Joffrey is basically working on reverbium. And Kingpin basically says, hey, look, if this is a metal that can amplify sound, then what we're going to do is we're going to steal it. And we're literally going to weaponize it and then sell it to any government that wants to buy it. Again, it's really just, you know, it's, it's pure, it's, it's just pure money grubbing here when it comes to King 
man, that's really all that's that's really all this aspect of the story is. But what happens is Kingsley travels to what used to be the domain of Norman Osborne. Because keep in mind, you know, this is after the events of Dark Reign, this is after the events of Siege, and so Norman Osborne is no longer uh, a main character. Instead, he's very much just gone from the public eye. And so because of that, you know, when Kingsley actually gets into Norman Osborne's lab and starts going through his personal things, he's met by Phil Urich. Now, Phil Urich is one of the people who was associated with uh, with the Daily Bugle, and his whole idea is that he's basically the nephew of the now famous Ben Urich, who did so much reporting during the events of Civil War. But what happens is Phil Urich, while he's being attacked by a hobgoblin, essentially just freaks. Now, with Phil Urich, the funny thing about him is that he was a goblin at one point in time. In fact, he was the Green Goblin during the events of the Onslaught Saga, so it's not like he's brand new to all this. He's not a creation by Dan Slott. Instead, for the character of Phil Urich, this is a return to familiarity in a lot of different ways, except now he's taking on the role of Hobgoblin. Now, as far as I'm aware, the only Goblin role that Phil Urich played up to this point was the Green Goblin. I may be wrong, although I don't think I am, but if I am, feel free to uh, feel free to correct me down there. But as far as I'm aware, he was only ever uh, only ever the Green Goblin, but taking over the role of Hobgoblin, what's really interesting about this is that it really shines into effect the nature of the Kingpin, in the sense that Kingpin doesn't really care who it is that fulfills a contract, as long as what he's trying to acquire is brought in, you know, as long as what it is that he's looking for is brought to him. Now, at this point, uh, we basically pick up in City Hall, and again, this is really kind of funny here, because J. Jonah Jameson still hates the idea of Spider-Man, I mean, he's always going to hate Spider-Man, and what's kind of cool is Captain America shows up and says, hey, look, I really want Spider-Man to receive, like, you're doing the whole honorary thing of the key to the city, I really think Spider-Man should be the one to get this. Now, this this immediately strikes, you know, <laughs> this immediately strikes J. Jonah Jameson as, no, 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 that's not going to happen. I absolutely hate Spider-Man. I'm not going to give it to him. I'm going to give it, uh, going to give it to my son. Now, the funny thing about this is that his son shows up, you know, and he says, hey, you know, I would love to have the key to the city, but I really do think it needs to go to Spider-Man because he's done so many great deeds. So it's not the most significant thing in the world. It's just kind of a, it's kind of funny to see J. Jonah Jameson being put in such a, a strange situation. But again, picking back up again with uh, with Horizon Labs, this is when we really start to get this full explanation from Max Modell, in the sense that we're introduced to a few other characters here and there, you know, a few more members, which is part of the uh, the Elite Seven, or the, the not really like the Secret Seven, but it's part of like the top seven people who were there, the ones that can come and go as they please, work on whatever it is that they want to, and uh, Peter Parker is basically given his own lab. He's given the ability to work on whatever it is that he wants to work on. The issue with this is that while he's in the middle of studying, while he's in the middle of reading what he needs to read and try to get things in order, uh, the entire Horizon Labs facility is immediately attacked by the Hobgoblin. Now, this is actually kind of cool because Dan Slott was messing around with us a little bit. I mean, we, we would sit here and we would think, well, this is these are some of the smartest people on the face of the planet. And so if Peter Parker's suddenly not there and Spider-Man is there, then it would seem like the easiest thing to figure out or the easiest thing to understand or to you know come to the conclusion of is that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Not only that, Remember, Phil Urich has his, you know, goblin scream, so to speak, which basically, you know, it, it causes, it wreaks all kinds of havoc in the sense that it's basically a sonic scream. And so because of this, it incapacitates Peter Parker, you know, it, it causes physical reactions in the sense that he's bleeding out of his eyes, you know, and so what happens is in the middle of this conflict, Peter Parker is able to, to make his escape by the, the skin of his pants. Max Modell yanks the fire alarm, and what it does is it kind of balances things out a bit in the sense that it more or less sends, you know, the hobgoblin off, just kind of running for, for the middle of nowhere. Spider-Man, of course, chases after him and it's kind of this cat and mouse game and the sense of spider-man's trying to figure out why hobgoblins come back he's trying to figure out while he's there but in the end it doesn't really matter because hobgoblin's able to make off with this uh, reverbium as it's been created by sajani joffrey and so one of the funny moments here this is this is why i love this so much is uh, at this point you know once it's all said and done we have uh, captain captain watanabe of the uh, of the new york police department that shows up and of course uh, peter parker changing out of his spider-man uniform has to come up with an excuse for why it is that he wasn't out there when one of the people was like, hey, I took a head count and Peter Parker's not here. When they go into his lab, he's wearing headphones and he's naked. <laughs> And his response is that, well, this is how I function. Like, I put headphones on, I listen to music, you know, I, I study when I'm naked. You know, it was the only excuse that he could come up with spur of the moment. And this is why so many fans loved Peter Parker, because it was just small moments like this that were absolutely hilarious. It was small moments like this that were amazing. But at this point, we pick up with Hobgoblin uh, joining Wilson Fisk. And this is why I say Wilson Fisk doesn't really care uh, what goes on with a contract. Instead, he says, where's Roderick Kingsley? Like, where's Kingsley at? And the response of, of you know, Phil Urich Hobgoblin is, it doesn't 
doesn't really matter. Like it, it doesn't matter at all. I mean, he's gone, he's dead, you know, but the contract's been fulfilled and Kingpin says, cool beans. Now, the funny thing is he doesn't really trust Kingsley that much. He's not really sure how he feels about him, but he did uphold the contract. He did fulfill what it was that Kingpin was looking for. And that's all he ever really cares about. Now, at this point, we rejoin Black Cat. And that's why I say she was gonna have more of a significant role later on in the story. And I love what Dan Slott does with this. Historically speaking, there's always been this sort of cat and mouse game, not to, to make a pun, but there's always been this sort of cat and mouse game between Peter Parker and, uh, and, and Black Cat in the sense that it was always this sort of will they, won't they kind of thing. You know, like, are they ever gonna get together? Are they ever gonna actually have any real measure of an ongoing relationship? And that's really what Dan Slott does here. He toys with the notion there's a lot of sexual tension between the two of them and a lot of jokes that go on between the two of them. But at the end of the day, it's always Peter Parker saying, hey, this is why we don't date. <laughs> this is why we don't get together. But what Black Cat also says is that by way of her sources, she's come to the to the realization or she's been informed that the buyer of the, reverb, the reverbium that was stolen from uh, Horizon Labs is Kingpin. And so this really brings Spider-Man back into contact with Wilson Fisk again. Now, at this point, you know, he says, of course, you know, meet me at this location. The two of them end up getting together and a box just lands behind Black Cat. When she opens it up, there's glasses, there's an earpiece, the glasses say, put this on, or the goggles say, put this on. You know, when she does, she realizes that Peter Parker has a new suit, that he basically has a stealth suit. And what he says is this suit is designed to eliminate sound and eliminate people being able to see him in the sense that it, it minimalizes all of it. And so, or I guess minimizes all of it. <laughs> and so it's really his own stealth variation of what uh, Tony Stark had done before where he had made a stealth suit. And so this basically allows them to infiltrate, uh, you know, infiltrate Kingpin's base of operations in Shadowland and attempt to try to retrieve the reverbium. Now, something else to keep in mind here is that at this point, again, you know, Phil Jurg as Hobgoblin is very much in the employ of Kingpin, not to mention that Kingpin himself also has, you know, members of the Hand. Now, something that I want to point out here is that the Hand is a, this really clandestine organization of ninjas based out of Japan that go back quite some time. But overall, the gist is twofold when it comes to the Hand. The first is to, uh, to infiltrate various, you know, governmental agencies, subvert them from the inside out, operate from the shadows, that kind of thing. But they're basically also for hire in the sense that if you have enough money, you can hire, you can pay members of the Hand to carry out assassinations. Woe betide you if you don't pay them, but you can <laughs> you can hire them for the purpose of, of making assassinations, being bodyguards, things like that. And that's kind of the interesting thing is because the Hand are some of the best assassins in the entirety of the Marvel Universe. And so if you have them as bodyguards, you're almost guaranteed to stay safe, only with the exception of a few people here and there who can basically subvert them. Wolverine is a good example. Elektra is a good example, different things like that. But in the midst of all this, uh, with Hobgoblin, you know, basically responding to what seems to be a break-in with, uh, you know, Peter Parker arriving here along with Black Cat, Black Cat actually leaves Peter hanging. She kind of bails out in the middle of it and says, hey, like, you know, I was here to help you get this, but I'm literally a cat burglar and I know a losing game when I see one. So you're on your own. And she, she says, all I'm going to do is go to, you know, Wilson Fisk's personal office, steal some of his private collection and then sell it. Of course, uh, Wilson Fisk's head of security, so to speak, uh, figures out what's going on with Black Cat. You know, he's able to, su to subdue her. And when she's in the, the clutches of Kingpin, the funny thing about this is that, you know, Peter Parker's suit is designed to block out all methods of communication. Not only that, Hobgoblin had basically used his sonic scream in order to overpower the stealth suit or the stealth uh, aspect of Peter Parker's suit, which he responds in kind by, again, basically blocking out all sound in order to keep the Hobgoblin's sonic scream from affecting him. But the issue here is that he's oblivious to what's going on with regards to Felicia Hardy. He has no idea what's happening with regards to uh, her being taken by the Kingpin. And so in the end, what really ends up happening here is just a matter of circumstance that leads to uh, Felicia Hardy, you know, getting free, Spider-Man being able to make his escape in the sense that the uh, the sonic scream of Hobgoblin reflects off the, uh, the reverbium and literally begins to start bringing the building crashing down around him. And so, of course, Peter's able to jump in. He's able to save Felicia. Uh, he goes against the Kingpin for a little while, but that's really about it. I mean, he really just kind of whisks out of there and uh, he calls it a day. And so in response, we we basically wrap this section up with Dan Slott kind of, you know, leaving us a, a bit of a taste for what comes next. When we have Phil Yurick meeting with everybody at the Daily Bugle, you know, Robbie Robertson and all these guys back in the Daily Bugle again, as well as uh, him being, be, you know, basically being the inside man in the sense that he essentially knows everything that's going on when it comes to the Daily Bugle. He knows what Peter Parker's individual actions are, despite not knowing that Peter and Spider-Man are one and the same. It's really always him just kind of operating from the shadows. And what Dan Slott's basically doing is drawing a parallel between Peter Parker and Hobgoblin Phil Yurick in the sense of saying that, you know, in a lot of ways, Phil Yurick is this, this sort of Peter Parker uh, antithesis in the sense that Peter Parker was working as a Daily Bugle with a dual identity. He was Peter Parker, he was 
Spider-Man. He was selling photos to the Daily Bugle to show what it was that he was doing, or at least to show what Spider-Man was doing. That's how he was making his money. Hobgoblin is doing much the same thing, except instead of making money, he's using it to bolster his reputation. Meanwhile, Peter Parker has basically moved on from the Daily Bugle, and he's taking up residence in Horizon Labs, where he's basically making his money now, and he's making a lot of it. But this really kind of ends with the idea of, you know, basically Peter Parker's all new apartment. It's essentially a dance lot saying, here's where we are now. Peter Parker's got his own place. He's got his own girlfriend that's not Mary Jane Watson, that for him, all is right with the world. And it lives up to the title, Spider-Man Big Time, in the sense that Peter Parker has finally hit the big time. He's finally stepped into what he considers to be uh, a successful career, that he's no longer scrounging by by selling photographs to the Daily Bugle. Instead, he's got a legitimate career path. His intelligence is being used adequately. Uh, he really considers himself to have finally arrived. Okay, so I was originally going to do uh, Dan Slott's Amazing Spider-Man Volume 2, but what I decided to do was kind of wind the clock back a little bit, and instead, we're going to do a video on the origin of Anti-Venom. Now, the reason why we're doing this, and it's actually kind of like a fish out of water, you know, doing the story, but the reason why we're doing this is because of the fact that there's a there's like the third volume, I think, of Dan Slott's Amazing Spider-Man called The Return of Anti-Venom, and what I didn't want to do was try to cram the origin in with The Return of Anti-Venom, because it's like, hey guys, here's the return of a character that you don't know anything about, and so it's just kind of like, well, that's a problem, so I figured we'd go ahead and just kind of like, do the origin. But the cool thing about this is that this really deals in a lot of ways with the reshuffling of Eddie Brock and even the Spider-Man mythos to a degree. It's really more about Eddie Brock than Spider-Man than Peter Parker, uh, but the two kind of go hand in hand in terms of why it was done. And what I mean is following the events of, of One More Day, when Joe Quesada sat down and said, you know, we need to basically take away everything that dates Peter Parker. That is to say, everything that makes him anything other than just like a kid trying to find his way in the world. Uh, fans freaked and they, they freaked for the same reason that, you know, the pre-New 52 Wally West disappeared, things like that, you know, when fans latch on to a character, they don't really like to see them change. But more so than that, a lot of people grew up with like the Peter Parker, Mary Jane Watson relationship. And to suddenly see all that just tossed away because Peter Parker sold his soul to the devil so Aunt May could live for another 10 years really seemed just weird. And people just didn't like that at all. It was one of the most really reviled uh, Spider-Man stories in the history of his character's publication history, if not in the history of comics in general. And so the result was that Spider-Man fans and the media, so on and so forth, everybody just kind of ran J. Michael Straczynski off the title. And the result was that the Spider-Man, uh, the Spider-Man publications were basically run by a team of people. It was like Joe Quesada, you know, kind of throwing his hands in the air and saying, who wants to write Spider-Man? And everybody was like, well, I do. And so he was like, then all of you guys come over here and we'll all just write stories. And this is where Dan Slott initially kind of got a start. It's really not until big time that Dan Slott officially took over the Spider-Man title on his own. But the fact remains here that with this whole reshuffling of the Peter Parker mythos, there were a lot of things that were being introduced, a lot of things that were being done. And that's kind of the beauty, the benefit of this story is, yeah, it is in the middle of everything, but it's in the middle of everything before anything's fleshed out. And so a lot of the characters that we're going to see popping up here haven't really had their origin stories explained yet. That didn't come, you know, for another 10, 15, 20 issues after this particular publication. Uh, but the fact remains here that with, uh, with with Peter Parker, you know, picking up with him, the cool thing is that we kind of get this, you know, reminder of everything that's going on. And that's what, what I wanted to touch on for a second. So, you know, the, the whole origin of Peter Parker is timeless. You know, a kid who's a science geek, bitten by a radioactive spider, gets the proportional strength of a spider, he has spider sense, so on and so forth. Spider-Man is born, becomes a hero after the death of Uncle Ben, all that kind of good stuff. But the idea is that there are also some characters that are being introduced. You know, you have like Menace, for example. You have Mr. Negative, one half of a split personality between a guy named Martin Lee and, uh, or really a guy posing as Martin Lee and, and Mr. Negative. You have a few characters who are being introduced here and there. Of course, you've got your regular cast, so you have like uh, Harry Osborn, so on and so forth. But what this does is it initially picks up with a conflict between Menace and Spider-Man. Now, this is one of the things that I was talking about where we're kind of in the middle of things, but none of this has really been fleshed out. Menace is a character who popped up before this story happened, but the origin of Menace had never really been explored. That didn't happen until Amazing Spider-Man 586, I think. And uh, it turns out to be somebody that we're quite familiar with. <laughs> but the idea here is that Menace is in a lot of ways, kind of this reimagining of the Green Goblin, right? I mean, you know, Norman Osborn is like a like a, a, a an intrinsic villain of Spider-Man. You know, Marvel Cinematic Universe is giving us Vulture. That's cool. We know it's only a matter of time before the Green Goblin shows up. You couldn't have Spider-Man in any film and not feature the Green Goblin somewhere along the line. That's just people kind of want to break from all the disastrous versions of the Green Goblin that we've gotten from uh, from Sony so far. But the idea here is that Menace is, uh, really seems to be acting more like a vigilante, you know, in the sense that Menace doesn't really have an adherence to like one particular person. It's just Menace kind of pops up and says, here are the things that I'm about, you know, I'm about taking out Spider-Man, so on and so forth. But it's kind of this reminder where things stand. At the same time, uh, there are also a lot of refugees who seem to have been brought into the United States for reasons that we're not really sure about. And they're just kind of escaping, taking up residence. They'll actually kind of wrap back around towards 
towards the end of the story. But again, this is just kind of a reminder of the direction that things are going in, in terms of Peter Parker, where he stands, what he's about. But this is when we start to get into the idea of Frontline. Now, uh, prior to this, a guy by the name of Dexter Bennett had basically purchased the Daily Bugle. The problem with this is that instead of upholding the traditions of J. Jonah Jameson by keeping the Daily Bugle as a reputable news source, albeit a reputable news source that's slanted against Spider-Man, <laughs> the fact remains that Dexter Bennett basically turned it into a tabloid magazine. It was like the National Enquirer, the Weekly World News. It was the, the lowest of any form of publication. And because of what, because of that, uh, Peter Parker effectively left. Now, it, it was really more of like, I guess, a firing than him actual, uh, actually leaving. And the reason why it was because of the fact that under, you know, the, the leadership of Dexter Bennett, Peter Parker was basically transformed into a member of the paparazzi. But his actions in taking photographs of people, albeit not really wanting to do so, led to the deaths of one of the people that he was photographing. And so following that, realizing that his action was leading to the death of people, he basically vacated. Now, prior to this, Robbie Robertson had left, Sally Floyd, uh, Ben Urich, they had all taken off to form Frontline. Now, of course, Frontline is a, is a name you guys are probably familiar with, with regards to Civil War. You know, initially it started out as a blog, but it was transformed into a wholesale news company uh, following the conclusion of Civil War. And what's also going on here is that Frontline itself, you know, kind of picking up where J. Jonah Jameson's Daily Bugle left off after it was bought by, uh, by Dexter Bennett, you know, by considering itself to be a reputable news source. It's not focusing on the glitz and glamour tabloid stuff and focusing on actual important stories. Uh, Frontline is focusing on a guy by the name of Randall Crown. Now, the reason why they're focusing on Randall Crown is because he's a mayoral candidate. But the idea here is that he is involved in these individuals, you know, that Spider-Man was dealing with, those individuals who were running off in the fight, all of whom appear to have been trafficked into the United States. And so the idea is that Randall Crown is working with some third party. We don't really know what it is, but he's working with some individual to traffic humans into the U.S. for whatever the reason happens to be. But what we end up doing is we basically pick up with uh, with Norman Osborn's Thunderbolts. Now, this is when we start to get into the aftermath of Civil War. I mean, we've done Secret Invasion, right? Like we talked about the Secret Invasion event. You can find that down in the description of this video. But Secret Invasion basically dealt with the aftermath, you know, following the death of Captain America, you know, following the main Civil War event itself. It was kind of uh, Marvel bringing to a close this whole idea of the Superhuman Registration Act. And Secret Invasion concluded with Tony Stark being ousted as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Norman Osborn taking his place. And so because Norman Osborn took his place, Norman Osborn disbanded S.H.I.E.L.D., put Hammer in its place, and basically used the Thunderbolts as a way for him to begin going through and carrying out his own individual campaigns. Now, I know a lot of you guys are probably asking about Eddie Brock. A lot of you guys want to know what's going on with Eddie Brock. And so what we do is we transition to a place called Feast. And Feast is basically, a, it, it really stands for the idea of uh, a food emergency aid, shelter, and training. It's run by this guy named Mr. Lee for the purpose of grabbing individuals who are homeless, who have been displaced, whatever the case may be, and giving them the tools they need to get back on their feet and to find success. And so what happens is, I guess we basically find out that Aunt May is volunteering at this facility, but the entire basis behind uh, this, this introduction comes by way of Betty Brandt. Now, of course, the cool thing about Betty Brandt is she's a longtime member of the Spider-Man mythos. I mean, she goes back, you know, a long, long, long time. And in fact, she was the first romantic interest of Peter Parker before Gwen Stacy. It, I don't think it was really short-lived. It was really more of, you know, Marvel kind of, uh, kind of toying around with the idea before Gwen Stacy and Peter got together. But she's here because of the fact that Dexter Bennett basically says, look, I'm a supporter of Randall Crown. All right. This newspaper is basically going to serve as the media arm of Randall Crown. We're going to do everything we can to get him elected. If there's a publication out there that's posting information that basically contradicts the idea that Randall Crown is the best candidate, then your job, Betty Brand, is to go find information to discredit those individuals. In this instance, Bill Hollister. Bill Hollister is a guy who's basically running against uh, Randall Crown. And what Dexter Bennett says is, go find a guy named Martin Lee. He's basically helping to fund the campaign of Bill Hollister. Your job is to report on him and to find dirt on that guy so we can use that to discredit Bill Hollister. We can say, you know, well, Bill Hollister is being funded by a criminal. He's being funded by a guy who's involved in trafficking, whatever the case may be. Find information so that we can use it to discredit Hollister. And so with Betty Brandt showing up here at the uh, at the feast facility, this is when we pick up with Eddie Brock. Now, the reason why I, I kind of waited until this point to talk about this, because I know a lot of you guys are kind of like, there was a lot, there was a lot going on with Eddie Brock. Yes, there was. Um, Sal at Comic Pop and myself actually had this really cool conversation. I called him and asked him some questions about Eddie Brock because there were a few things that I was I was curious about because I didn't really know how we got from A to B. I mean, I knew Eddie Brock was Venom. He was one of Spider-Man's most formidable villains. They were on again, off again allies. You know, Eddie Brock had his own moral code, but I didn't know how we got from Eddie Brock being Venom to Eddie Brock basically being a cancer patient. And so when I was talking to Sal at Comic Pop, he had a really good statement where he basically said that following the events of One More Day, Marvel looked at Eddie Brock as like this holdover from the 1990s that just wasn't really relevant anymore. So what Marvel wanted to do was reshuffle the Venom concept around and see if they could shop it around to different characters and then finally find one that they could set on. So what they did is they 
they basically pass the Venom symbiote from Eddie Brock to Matt Gargan, also known as Scorpion. And that's the reason why if you guys see Venom as part of Thunderbolts, which you will see here, that's Scorpion. That's not actually Eddie Brock. That's why you're seeing, you know, really Eddie and Venom in two different locations. Uh, but the idea here is that for the character of Eddie, uh, Marvel did a lot of changing with regards to his origin, with regards to his backstory, and him suffering from cancer was the way in which they transitioned things. What Marvel did is with, uh, I think it was Spectacular Spider-Man Volume 2, the first five issues composed a story called The Hunger. And what it basically said is where the original introduction of Venom established that uh, that Eddie Brock was a guy whose career was basically ruined by Peter Parker or by Spider-Man, and he bonded with the Venom symbiote for retribution. What Marvel does is they came back and said, no, that's not really the case. Instead, what happened was Eddie Brock had cancer, and the Venom symbiote bonded itself to Eddie Brock uh, just for the simple fact that Eddie Brock's body was just pumping out chemicals like crazy, and it would keep the Venom symbiote going. And so in response to that, every time Eddie Brock uh, went after Spider-Man, every time the two of them got into a conflict, Eddie Brock was acting on the defensive. He was terrified that if Spider-Man took the Venom symbiote away from him, it would result in him dying. Now, eventually, what Marvel did is they came back between 2004 and 2007, and they started launching all these small little stories about Eddie Brock. There were about two or three of them. And what happened is Eddie Brock basically cast off the symbiote uh, itself. He came to terms with the idea that he was going to die, and this basically picked up with him succumbing to his cancer, or at least appearing to succumb to his cancer, and falling into the process of dying. Now, again, this ties into the idea that Marvel was moving the Venom symbiote away from Eddie and putting it on, on Scorpion, but what happens is Eddie Brock basically travels to the feast facility. He meets with Mr. Lee and Mr. Lee basically cures him. Now, this is the other half of the Mr. Negative persona. It's one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to wait to this point to cover that. But the whole Mr. Negative, Mr. Lee dichotomy is, is kind of strange. That's fleshed out in a different origin. We don't really know too much about him, not for this story anyway. The only thing we really need to know is that Mr. Lee, uh, the actual person that we're seeing here, is a guy that can heal people by touching them. When it comes to Mr. Negative, he's the other side of the coin. It's like this dichotomy between between good and evil, Bruce Banner, the Incredible Hulk, that kind of thing. You know, it's this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde uh, sort of situation. The face that we see here with Mr. Lee is the good side. But at this point, the way that Marvel's played this out, he doesn't know about the Mr. Negative persona. He just kind of switches over to it. And then Mr. Negative basically operates as a crime boss in Chinatown. But what happens is that where Mr. Lee had essentially touched Eddie Brock and cured him of his cancer, in this instance, when Mr. Lee's talking to Betty Brandt, and he's basically talking about how this place is considered to be a place of miracles, but how it's really, you know, God curing people, so on and so forth. When he touches Eddie Brock a second time, it reactivates the latent symbiote, uh, Venom symbiote in his body. Now, what this does is this basically sets the stage for the introduction of anti-venom, for the idea of Eddie Brock going from normal Eddie Brock to becoming anti-venom. And the way this is done is actually really, really cool. It's one of these interesting things where it's like a million different things all going on at the same time. But with Peter Parker heading back, you know, going back to his residence, he's encountered by Norman Osborn. Now, the reason why is because at this moment right now, Spider-Man's essentially a fugitive. And the reason why Spider-Man's a fugitive is because Norman Osborn, with all his power, all his ability, has been trying to find a way to bring Spider-Man down. The problem with this is that Spider-Man is an Avenger. Spider-Man is one of the world's most celebrated heroes. The other thing you have to keep in mind here is that following the events of One More Day, and I think during the events of Brand New Day, I'm not going to swear to that, Peter Parker went to Doctor Strange and had Doctor Strange wipe the world's mind that Peter Parker was Spider-Man. Of course, he revealed his identity during Civil War. That's why no one knows who he is, because Doctor Strange took care of that for him. And so the result is that Norman Osborn, all he really knows is that Peter Parker gets pictures of Spider-Man. The two of them seem to work together and he wants to know where Spider-Man is. That's why Spider-Man's being framed because Norman Osborn basically wants to make Spider-Man look like a murderer by going around killing people and then putting spider you know, spider tracker devices on these dead bodies so that anybody who covers a story, any forensic, you know, scientist, whoever it is that analyzes these bodies will come to the conclusion that Spider-Man killed them. Now, of course, we know Spider-Man didn't, but what this does is it allows Norman Osborn to kind of, you know, show up in uh, in New York, show up in Manhattan, and begin the process of trying to find Peter Parker. Now, with Norman Osborn basically being forced to vacate the apartment because of the fact that, you know, the, the roommate of Peter Parker, who at the time was a cop, uh, was basically showing up because of the fact that Norman Osborn didn't want to be seen as somebody who was, who was you know, caught abusing his power because likely it would lead to him being removed as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. What ended up happening here is he basically takes off and then Peter Parker as Spider-Man goes to see him in his base of operations, more or less to, to question him, to interrogate him to find out what it is he's doing because keep in mind while Norman Osborn doesn't know that Peter Parker's Spider-Man Peter Parker knows that Norman Osborn is the Green Goblin and where Norman Osborn is putting on the front that he's a legit guy where he's putting on the front to the world that he's a capable director of S.H.I.E.L.D. or I guess the director of Hammer at this point Peter Parker knows it's only a matter of time before his you know nefarious deeds come to light and so Peter Parker's half waiting it out half looking for information to verify that Norman
Norman Osborn's a bad guy because of course, you know, we know that he is. But what Norman Osborn had also done is in response to the idea that he had to leave Peter Parker's apartment early, he sent the rest of his Thunderbolts out, Songbird, Venom, so on and so forth, sent them all out and basically said, go find Spider-Man, do whatever you need to do, but go find Spider-Man. Of course, not realizing the Spider-Man was gonna show up on his doorstep. But what happened is the Venom symbiote was basically tracking down its previous host, you know, tracking down the last host that it had. The issue with this is that one thing to keep in mind, the Venom symbiote has a mind of its own in a lot of ways. Not only that, um, you know, Matt Gargan doesn't really know how to use it effectively. He's still relatively new to the whole Venom concept. And so he's not nearly as adept or as used to Venom as uh, as Eddie Brock is. And the result is that the Venom symbiote is actually tracking down, or at least it seems like it's tracking down Eddie Brock. And the reason why is because what it does is it smashes into the Feast facility and encounters Eddie Brock with the intention of re-merging with him. The issue with this is that when the Venom symbiote accesses his body, it jumpstarts this latent, you know, symbiote, uh, these symbiote cells inside the body of, of Eddie Brock. And what he does is he emerges as anti-venom. Now, with regards to Marvel creating this uh, this standard, they had to find a way to differentiate the two, right? I mean, all the symbiotes have some aspect of them that make them uh, make them unique, whether it's toxin, basically the child of carnage, whether it is, uh, you know, venom itself, whether it is carnage itself, whatever the case may be, a lot of the symbiotes have things that make them different, that make them unique. They they share a lot of common traits, the immunity to Spider-Man, Spider-Sense, you know, the, the same sort of abilities that Spider-Man has, wall crawling, shooting webs, so on and so forth. For anti-venom, he's basically a guy, or at least the powers that, that anti-venom has are almost like a like a healing touch, so to speak, in the sense that, you know, the abilities of Martin Lee were absorbed to some capacity or in some form or fashion. But what anti-venom has the ability to do is to basically touch the bodies of other people and cleanse them of impurities. And what this does is it gives venom a weakness to anti-venom in the form that whenever Eddie Brock touches the venom symbiote, the venom symbiote will start to recoil. It'll start to, to sort of go away because of the fact that it's literally being burned. It's like putting fire to your skin. And so what happens is Spider-Man, of course, shows up on the scene, realizing that the you know that Venom's basically shown up at the Feast facility where Aunt May works. And it's just like this three-way battle between the two. And it's actually really kind of cool to see. It's like Spider-Man versus Anti-Venom versus Venom. And it's awesome. <laughs> I love, I love things like this. I love the way these events, uh, you know, kind of kind of coalesce, the way these little stories uh, coalesce and, and begin to come together. But in the midst of this whole conflict, in the midst of all this madness, we suddenly have the menace arriving. Now, of course, with the menace showing up here, it's really for the purpose of, uh, of grabbing Bill Hollister, carrying out his own goals, carrying out his own means. And so what we do is while, you know, Menace basically takes off with Bill Hollister, or at least it seems like Menace is taking off with Bill Hollister, we have Spider-Man, you know, Peter Parker, of course, planting his camera for the purpose of taking pictures so we can give them to Frontline and then engaging in the conflict. The funny thing about this is it's kind of like a mistake of identity, right? I mean, Peter Parker comes to realize that anti-venom is Eddie Brock, but in his mind, Eddie Brock is a bad guy. You know, if Eddie Brock is wearing a symbiote, then it means Eddie Brock's going to go do bad stuff. And this is a huge deal because, yeah, Cletus Cassidy was dangerous, you know, but Eddie Brock knows how to fight Spider-Man in a way Carnage may never know. Now, of course, they're both equally dangerous. And, and, and in truth, I would go as far as to say that if if we're talking about a direct fight, it's Peter Parker going against Carnage, Peter Parker going, going against Venom, it might be kind of a tough sell to tell me that Venom might get the upper hand, that in the end, Carnage would be, probably be the one to come out on top. But the idea here is that Peter Parker basically says, look, you know, if you're Eddie Brock, then you must be a bad guy, but you're fighting Venom. So are you a bad guy? Is Peter Parker trying to get his bearings, trying to understand what's going on, but while this is happening, kind of staying out of the way at the same time. And so a really funny moment uh, ends up happening here. You know, when Peter Parker takes this philosophy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. When he tells, you know, Anti-Venom, he's like, hey, you hate Venom, right? And Anti-Venom's like, yeah. And he's like, well, I hate him too. Let's team up. And then they basically team up against Venom and uh, and start taking him out. And it's really cool to see. It's, it's it's really fun to see. But the issue with this is that, you know, when, uh, when Matt Gargan is basically cured, or at least it seems like he's cured, of this Venom symbiote, where it's basically removed from his body, Anti-Venom basically turns his sights to uh, to Peter Parker. Now, the funny thing about this is he says, look, I can sense that you that you have issues, that, that your, your blood is not as pure as it needs to be. Part of this is because of the fact that at some point along the line, you were exposed to radioactive man. So you've got a little bit of radiation in your blood, but then he also realizes, oh, you've got a lot of radiation in your blood. Now, we know that that's how Peter Parker's powers function. You know, Peter Parker has his abilities because his blood is irradiated. And so if Anti-Venom were to be able to go through 
through with what it is that he's doing right now, which is basically purging the radiation from the blood of Peter Parker, he would lose all of his spider powers. And so it's kind of cool seeing this whole thing go on. The problem with this is that while all these events are unfolding, of course, when the cops had shown up, when Menace was trying to take Bill Hollister and uh, Menace was forced to leave Bill Hollister behind, that Menace comes across Norman Osborn. Now, this is cool because this is kind of this return to familiarity with Norman Osborn, right? Like there are moments in his character's publication history that are iconic. For example, the death of the Green Goblin. When uh, when Harry, um, I almost said when Harry Potter, when Norman Osborn and Peter Parker fought following the night Gwen Stacy died, that it resulted in uh, really in, in Norman Osborn falling on his own sword, you know, being impaled by his own glider. Uh, in a lot of ways, this bears some hallmarks to that particular fight in the sense that Menace is using the uh, various devices of Norman Osborn. Menace is, uh, you know, facing off against him. And the fight's very similar to the conflict between the two. And even Menace, you know, Menace itself references the instance where Norman Osborn basically died against Peter Parker and says, hey, look, you were impaled on your own glider before. Let's see if we can do it again. Now, in the middle of this whole conflict with, uh, you know, between Peter Parker and Anti-Venom, the forces of the Thunderbolts arrive on the scene. And the reason why is because of the fact that Norman Osborn is like, look, guys, we got to go. <laughs> we got to bail. The authorities are moving in here. We're making too much of a scene. We're supposed to be operating behind the scenes. No one's supposed to know that my hand is here. No one's supposed to catch my hand in the cookie jar. So he says, in order to keep that from happening, we got to bail out. So he says, grab Matt Gargan. We'll get him out of here. You know, and of course, the idea is grab Peter Parker or grab Spider-Man if he can as well. Of course, they're not able to. And uh, Peter Parker essentially makes his escape at the same time. It's Marvel setting the stage for the uh, the whole events, the, the whole situation with the future of Anti-Venom and the sense that Anti-Venom kind of sits down for a second and says, okay, Spider-Man took off. I can go after Spider-Man or I can go after Venom. What Anti-Venom says is I'm going to pursue Venom. My goal is going to be to take him out and remove the last vestiges of the Venom symbiote, the, those little cells or what have you, from the body of, uh, of, of Scorpion, basically removing his ability to become Venom. And so because of this, with everything kind of wrapping up, you know, Peter Parker travels back, checks on his Aunt May, makes sure that everything's all right. But then we also have uh, Norman Osborn Osborn speaking directly to uh, to Randall Crown. And what we find out is that Norman Osborn and Randall Crown were essentially working together in the sense that Randall Crown was was uh, was trafficking people into the US by way of the various, you know, cargo ships and so on and so forth that belonged to Norman Osborn. Of course, this was really, you know, kind of a big deal. It was a very hush-hush thing for Osborn just because of the fact that if it came to light that he was complicit in the trafficking of humans, it would bring down everything that he's worked so hard for. Because remember, what Norman Osborn's trying to do is basically take over the United States. You know, we've talked about that before. We haven't really covered Dark Reign directly, but that was the whole basis of Dark Reign, was him trying to take over the United States, the Dark Avengers, the Dark X-Men, so on and so forth. It was him trying to conquer everything. And so what he does is he grabs the camera that Peter Parker had basically left behind, you know, forgetting that it was there, and he starts showing the photos to the members of the Thunderbolts, and he says, there's a weakness here. There's a weakness here that we can exploit. And what he does is he says, whenever this, this camera's posted up, it's basically whoever, whoever Spider-Man is getting pictures for himself. And what he says is that inside the suit on the spider is basically a tracking device and the camera follows the spider suit which is how it is that it's always able to get these perfect shots that's why the camera is just not taking shots of an empty road you know it is it's actually following his physical body and that's why he's always got his chest or his suit turned out to the camera so we can take pictures of him while he's moving but what Norman Osborn says is what we can do is we basically we can basically tap into the frequency that this camera uses to follow the device in his chest and we can in turn find a way to basically infiltrate spider-man's spider sense to basically deceive it so he doesn't know that we're there. We can use that, you know, to our own advantage. And then we can take him out from close quarters, from a distance. We can shoot him while he's going from building to building and his spider sense will not alert him to what it is that's about to happen. Now, from here, we find out that among the various soldiers that exist as part of uh, Norman Osborn's regime is actually anti-venom. It's Eddie Brock. And this is when we learn that his suit basically allows him to shapeshift. It allows him to take on virtually any form that he wants to. And the result is that he's essentially infiltrating this. Now, the cool thing is that, again, Eddie Brock is anti-venom you know it's, it's kind of like a it's trying to be a hero he's trying to be a good guy and that's one of the things that makes him so unique the problem with this is that after this story i don't think he shows up again until the return of anti-venom so it's kind of sad to see him only show up for a handful of comics but the idea here is that he's essentially keeping tabs on everything that's going on monitoring everything that's taking place now with regards to matt gargan with regards to scorpion basically losing his ability to become venom it's not like the venom symbiote has gone from his body in its entirety it's still there the issue is that it's basically been damaged to the 
point that it almost seems to be beyond repair. And so what happens is uh, Radioactive Man basically begins to expose the body of Matt Gargan to radioactivity. And the reason why is because the goal is to basically take a blood sample and see if there's a way to essentially remove the antibodies basically that Antivenom puts out to remove those from the body of, uh, of, of Matt Gargan. And so what happens is Norman Osborn actually takes these chemicals and uses them on a guy named Freak. Now, Freak was originally introduced as a drug addict in the Amazing Spider-Man story. That's really all he was. He's a character that was created as a means to an end. And what I mean by that is he appeared in a couple stories here and there, but this is by far the most notable role he played. Freak was basically a guy who grabbed just a random syringe, injected himself with the chemicals from Kirk Connors from the Lizard's Lab, and then suddenly he developed the ability to basically adapt to any situation. Uh, he's not, you know, he's, he's not like a, a mutant or anything, and it's not an instantaneous thing. Instead, what happens is, you know, he'll be burned alive, for example, and then his body will enter a chrysalis stage and he'll come out immune to fire. And that's the way his body functions. It gets to the point where he just basically is immortal, like he can't be killed. And that's what Norman Osborn's banking on here. What he does is he takes the uh, antivenom compound, uh, the antivenom compound, he injects it into the body of Freak with the intention of creating this super venom. And the purpose of having the super venom will basically be to kind of lay waste to things. You know, I mean, that's the danger of it is that a few drops will ultimately end up killing people. And so what happens is Norman Osborn basically goes back to his lab for the purpose of using this chemical to, to engineer it, modify it a bit, and then jumpstart the powers of, uh, of Matt Gargan, allowing him to become Venom again. The funny thing about this, though, is this is kind of like this resurgence of the Green Goblin. Not perfectly, not in the sense that like the Green Goblin has been gone forever. The Green Goblin's been around, but this is just another instance where he shows up. It's another instance of this sort of split situation in the mind and in the body of, uh, of, of Norman Osborn. Now, from here, it's also, you know, again, Bullseye and the various members of the Thunderbolts carrying out the mission of, uh, of Norman Osborn, basically finding Peter Parker, because or at least finding Spider-Man, because again, they're basically using the, the frequency that the camera uses to, uh, to access his device in his chest to tap into his location, to basically use it like a homing device. And that's exactly what they do. You have Bullseye, you have a handful of soldiers that locate Spider-Man and track him down. The problem with this is that in the midst of their efforts to take out Spider-Man, the entire group is suddenly met with the arrival of Anti-Venom. And this is cool, because Anti-Venom basically takes all these guys out. And it's interesting to see these two guys pair up, because it turns into an actual team-up, but it starts as like a weird situation that Spider-Man just doesn't really know how to work his mind around. I mean, he's used to Eddie Brock being a bad guy. He's used to Eddie Brock only working alongside him in certain situations. For example, the emergence of Carnage. And so because of that, the two of them actually working alongside, you know, working side by side as heroes. The idea of, uh, of, of Anti-Venom saying, hey, look, you left your camera behind, they took it, and that's how they found you. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's sort of a weird situation for Peter Parker. And so ultimately what happens is uh, Anti-Venom and Parker are able to, to basically take out uh, these various soldiers, knock out Bullseye, and then just bail out. Now, of course, we also have Matt Gargan being injected with the serum. The issue is that it's not an instantaneous thing. It'll take time for the Venom symbiote to come back. And the reason why is because the purpose of the serum is to basically burn out the anti-Venom antibodies and allow the Venom symbiote to begin re-emerging. And so while it's in the process of doing that, uh, Scorpion's basically given an updated Scorpion suit. And so again, this is Marvel kind of toying. This is Marvel going back and forth saying, hey guys, you know, you're getting the best of both. You're basically getting a side-by-side -side comparison. Here's a story where you see the Scorpion and you see the Scorpion as Venom in the exact same situations, in the exact same conflicts, which one do you like more is really kind of what was going on here. And so the result is that we, you know, we really get to kind of choose which one we enjoy, which one we don't enjoy. And so uh, picking up with Spider-Man and picking up with Anti-Venom, the idea here is Anti-Venom basically says, hey, look, Norman Osborn, the Thunderbolts, the guys you're looking for, they all went back to, uh, to, to the Osborn lab. They're all back there. You need to go to the Osborn research group if you want to track them down. And so it was kind of cool seeing these two guys work together, but we also see some really cool bit of ingenuity. The reason why this works so well and the reason why team-ups between Venom and Spider-Man have always worked is because it's like they're two sides of the same coin. You've got Spider-Man with his spider sense, you know, with his capabilities, his agility, strength, so on and so forth. And you've got Eddie Brock with his experience as part of Venom, you know, with the Venom symbiote. And so because of that, we basically have, you know, what looks like Spider-Man infiltrating the facility and being attacked by the Thunderbolts only for us to find out that's not Spider-Man. That's actually anti-Venom shape-shifted as Spider-Man. And so it's cool to see these, these things go against each other. It's cool to see them function. And so what happens is, of course, you know, Green Goblin makes his presence known. He and Spider-Man fight for a little while. It's kind of wrapping these things up by giving us a bit of fan service in terms of the, the characters, you know, fighting against one another. But we also find out that a lot of these people that have been brought in, a lot of these humans that have been
have been trafficked, that have been kidnapped, were being experimented on. And so the question is, okay, you know, where's this road going to lead? Now, we're actually not going to find that out. We're not going to find out here uh, where this road leads. Instead, what we do is we basically pick up with uh, with Scorpion, you know, again, continuing to fight against, uh, against Anti-Venom and then actually injecting him with a barb that basically seems to take away Eddie Brock's ability to be Venom. Instead, following this, we have Matt Gargan just re, you know, re-invoking this Venom symbiote after it's finally healed and re-emerging, sort of going forward with the assumption that Anti-Venom is basically defeated, that he can't come back from this. And so during the entirety of this conflict, Norman Osborn had essentially activated a self-destruct in the building with the idea that the entire building was going to come crashing down, that everybody was going to be killed. Spider-Man was going to die. You know, of course, Freak still in that building was going to die. We know they made it out. But in the end, it's this idea that, that we're kind of left with a few unanswered questions in the sense of these individuals who are being experimented on, so on and so forth. But we're also left with the idea of anti-venom, you know, kind of focusing on Eddie Brock himself. In the end, he just sort of says, hey, look, you know, life gave me a second chance. Life gave me the opportunity to go forward and be a hero. The question is, what am I going to do with this heroic role? Okay, so picking up with the Amazing Spider-Man, again, picking up with like the main Amazing Spider-Man now that we've kind of done the origin of Anti-Venom, this is really kind of cool. I mean, again, you know, in, in the last video, we had talked about how after the events of uh, One More Day, that the Spider-Man title just kind of turned into like a committee-based publication in the sense that it was like a group of people writing it. And we had also talked about how there were a few changes that were being fleshed out here and there in terms of when Dan Slott officially took over as the sole writer of the title with Spider-Man big time. But we were talking about how Dan Slott was basically getting rid of a lot of the things that he didn't like, you know, about the, the whole committee writing everything, how he basically wanted to kind of clear the landscape and make the Spider-Man title all his own. And that's usually what happens. You know, when it comes to a writer taking over a publication, they'll go about it in different ways. Some writers will just kind of build on what's already there. Other writers will wipe the slate clean and start over again. A really good example is like Black Panther, you know, for example. When it came to the mythos of the character as he was created, Christopher Priest had like the landmark run in volume three that basically introduced all kinds of new concepts expanded on the Black Panther mythos. Instead of wiping all that clean, during the events of Avengers and New Avengers, Jonathan Hickman built on that and then added something called the Necropolis, which is where Black Panther communicates with the dead, with the Black Panthers of the past, those individuals that have held the title before him and died of old age or just died in combat or whatever the case may be. And then right now with, with uh, Ta-Nehisi, who's writing the story of Black Panther, he's building on top of all of that and adding his own stuff into it. So different writers take things different ways. But with Dan Slott, he looked around at the Spider-Man mythos and he said, okay, so here's where we stand. Following the events of One More Day, Marvel had basically come along. They had uh, Flash Thompson as part of the U.S. Army. Uh, he basically fell into a coma due to some injuries. When he woke up, uh, he had basically forgotten a lot of the conflict and a lot of the strife that he had put Peter Parker through when they were in high school. So it was kind of a way to reinvigorate the character of Flash Thompson, and they went forward as friends. This allowed for Marvel to basically spin Flash Thompson out, so he would eventually become Agent Venom. With uh, I think that that first story arc began in, Sp in The Amazing Spider-Man in this volume, actually, and uh, as a backup feature in this particular story with Amazing Spider-Man 653 or 654 or something like that. And then they turn around and they said, okay, so Mary Jane Watson, prior to One More Day, Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson have been married for years. After One More Day, they basically retconned it so the two of them never got married. That when they were supposed to get married, Peter Parker's, uh, you know, adventures as Spider-Man resulted in him missing his wedding date. And so while Mary Jane Watson, as part of Spider-Man big time right now, still knows his identity, instead of ever having been married, they dated, you know, very passionately for a while and they're just friends at this point in time. It was adding in things like Aunt May getting married to J.J. Jonah Jameson's father, the introduction of Carly Cooper as the girlfriend of Peter Parker. It was just kind of structuring things, shifting things, moving things around in a way that Dan Slott could kind of look at this landscape and say, okay, what do we want to keep and what do we want to get rid of? And so that's what a lot of this does. Spider-Man big time for the first, you know, few volumes really going up to like Spider Island uh, began the process of getting rid of a lot of the things that Dan Slott didn't like, but it was also the idea of building up to superior Spider-Man, the idea that Dr. Octopus would take over the body of Peter Parker. Now, what this does, this is, that's kind of a, a long, you know, exposition in terms of uh, in terms of getting into the story. But what this does, and the reason why I wanted to quote, go ahead and make those points, is because we really kind of pick up with Peter Parker in his off time, and this is why a lot of Spider-Man fans loved Peter Parker as Spider-Man. That's why they loved his stories, because you would see just as many, you know, volumes, just as many story arcs that dealt with him being Spider-Man, fighting bad guys, teaming up with the Avengers, Fantastic Four, and so on, as you would Peter Parker in his off time, what he's doing when he's not Spider-Man. It was this well-rounded, well-fleshed-out life of Peter Parker within Marvel Comics, which is why he's like this timeless character. You know, Peter Parker will never go away. He's like Batman. He's like Superman. You know, he'll be known 
from now until really until humanity collapses in its entirety. But the cool thing about this is this does kind of harken back to the idea of Mary Jane. And that's why I wanted to throw that in there, because of course, with Peter Parker cheering on Carly Cooper, you know, telling her, yeah, you know, you're doing a great, jo a great job as, as she's, uh, you know, doing her roller derby thing. Mary Jane kind of makes these comments about how, you know, Peter Parker really got his life together. You know, he was able to balance his life as Peter Parker and his life as Spider-Man, but he did it without Mary Jane. Now, again, this is Dan Slott kind of reaffirming to the reader that the two of them are not together and they've never been married. Because remember, when Spider-Man Big Time was announced, when Marvel came along and they were like, hey guys, Spider-Man Big Time, it was like all new, all different Marvel for Amazing Spider-Man in the sense that it was like, hey guys, like this is the place to start. If you guys really want to get into Spider-Man, start now with Spider-Man Big Time. And even a lot of people who are Spider-Man fans, you go on the Marvel subreddit, or I don't really go there anymore, but if you go to like the Spider-Man subreddit, there'll be a lot of people who will say like Spider-Man Big Time is a, is a good place to jump off from if you want to get started. They, you know, tell you to read Wikipedia articles or something like that, or watch my videos if you want to, uh, want a good, a good idea of, of what to know if you're going to jump into it. But that's, this is kind of, you know, designed to be a great jumping off point for, for the amazing Spider-Man. So this is the reason why, because it's Dan Slott kind of showing us, you know, where things are, where they stand. Now at this point, uh, we transition over to Andrew's Air Force Base. And the reason why is because, uh, the son of J. Jonah Jameson is actually getting ready to go on a mission into space. The issue with this is that this segment sees the return of, uh, of Alistair Smythe. At least I think it's Smythe or it might be Smith. I don't know how you, how you want to pronounce it, but, uh, Alistair Smythe is the son of Spencer Smythe. And Spencer Smythe was a longtime villain of, uh, of Spider-Man, uh, really even J. Jonah Jameson, but the issue was he was defeated at almost every turn. Eventually this led to his death. And the result was that Alistair Smythe basically picked up the mantle of Spider Slayer. But much like his father, Alistair basically uses cybernetic enhancements to his advantage in the form of robots that are made or people who have existing cybernetic enhancements by, by improving them and then have like rallying them to his cause. So it's kind of like this reimagining of the Sinister Six to a degree that's not led by uh, Dr. Octopus. Not the exact same, but that's about the closest I can get in terms of offering a comparison. But Alistair Smith, his entire campaign here is really to just bring down everything that J. Jonah Jameson cares about. And the reason why is because he blames J. Jonah Jameson for the death of his father. Now, the issue here is that, of course, with Spider-Man being here, we also have Max Modell. Now, Max Modell doesn't seem like he would be an important thing, but it's huge. And the reason why is because he's one of the smartest people in the Marvel Universe. And the way that Dan Slott's going to do this is actually really cool, the way that he pulls this off. But again, this is really them just kind of analyzing the vessel, you know, going over the ship, so on and so forth, you know, looking at everything. And we basically have Dan Slott really telling us how it's all supposed to function. You know, Horizon Labs is behind this project to some of the best engineers in the world, so on and so forth. You know, it's expected to go off without a hitch. But transitioning back to uh, to Peter Parker, this is kind of the cool thing here because when he's hanging out with Carly Cooper, keep in mind, Carly does not know that he's Spider-Man. She just knows that he's Peter Parker. Mary Jane Watson, again, does know that he's Spider-Man. And so the funny thing is that when Peter's hanging out with Carly Cooper, he has to put on this show that he doesn't know how to roller skate. He doesn't know how to do any of that stuff. And it's a great bonding chance. I mean, that, that's really all it is. It's a great bonding experience for the two of them. You know, the two of them just really kind of having fun, that sort of thing. But of course, once she goes to get changed in order to, you know, for them to hang out, Peter Parker's like, I'm amazing when it comes to roller skating. <laughs> of course, his, uh, his enhanced agility, his balance, so on and so forth, makes him exceptional at this. But the other cool thing is a dance lot kind of begins to wrap up this loose end, or not really a loose end, but begins to kind of wrap things up with Mary Jane Watson, not in the sense that she's going to be out of the picture forever, but in the sense of telling us as the reader, here's how the two view each other. Of course, there's a conversation between the two of them. You know, Mary Jane kind of saying, you know, look, you really care. It looks like you really care about Carly Cooper. Are you going to tell her your secret? That kind of thing. And the reason why Mary Jane Watson is doing this is because, again, according to the new history between Peter and Mary, you know, she just didn't really like the idea of him functioning as the amazing Spider-Man and Peter Parker at the same time. The reason being because if they actually ended up getting married, because they toyed with that for a while, with the idea that they would actually go on to get married where, you know, they had missed their first wedding date. Uh, if the two of them actually did get married, his his actions as Spider-Man would put their child in jeopardy. Now, this is one of the reasons why Spider-Man Renew Your Vows was written during Secret Wars, because it was basically Marvel coming back and saying, well, what if in this particular story arc, you know, Mary Jane Watson and Peter Parker didn't take that route? What if instead they actually got married and they had a child? You know, what if one more day never took place? What would that universe look like? What would that world look like? Now, of course, we saw how all that unfolded, and we're actually seeing it now with regards to the uh, relaunch of Renew Your Vows. This is going to be kind of focusing on this Mary Jane Watson, Peter Parker, you know, sort of situation. Uh, but the idea here is that as they sort of leave, Peter's left with this idea of, hey, maybe I should tell her, maybe I should, you know, let her in on the secret that I have in terms of my identity. The kicker to all this, and this, here's the problem with all this, is that Peter Parker is basically recalled to the Air Force Base. And the reason why is because, you know, it's Peter Parker, one of the smartest people that's working at Horizon Labs. So not only that, because of his intelligence, because some of the things that he had achieved when we talked about, I guess in the last video, we had talked 
talked about Horizon Labs, he's kind of drawn this special eye of Max Modell in the sense that Max Modell doesn't really look at him as like a cut above the rest, but sees a lot of potential in Peter Parker, as Peter Parker being one of the smartest people that will ever exist in the Marvel Universe. Now, that doesn't mean Max Modell is like, yeah, man, Peter Parker's the next Reed Richards, but he's certainly wildly capable in terms of his uh, of his knowledge. And so because of that, he's kind of brought on in an advisory capacity to make sure that all the all the, the, the T's have been crossed, all the I's have been dotted and that kind of thing. But the problem with this is that his spider sense kicks in and he basically has to race off, you know, leaving Max Modell on his own. Now, of course, this is when we learn that Alistair Smith has a much larger plan here in the sense that where he brings in his various villains, of course, you know, within this Andrews Air Force base, you know, in the control tower, he has all his own minions, so on and so forth. He has a multitude of these little small bugs and different things like that, but it's designed for the purpose of wreaking absolute havoc. And so where these different forces jump in, it's really kind of like Peter Parker facing off against all these guys as best they can. The problem with this is that J. Jonah Jameson says, hey, look, man, you cannot face off against all these villains on your own. One, because there's just too many of them. And two, because my son's on that ship and that ship may crash, it may blow up. Who knows what's going to happen with it? And so ultimately, Peter Parker says that needs to be the main emphasis. That needs to be the main focus going to that vessel to make sure that nothing, you know, nothing erroneous takes place here. The problem is that once he gets on board, he's met with Matt Gargan. Now, I was holding off until this part of the story to basically get into this idea of Venom, but I imagine a lot of you guys watching this, uh, watching, you know, the video on Anti-Venom might have had some questions about what happens to the actual Venom symbiote when it comes to the character of Scorpion, because right now he doesn't have the Venom symbiote. So here was the deal. Between the time that Joe Quesada took over Marvel, or I guess took over the position of editor-in-chief in Marvel, really leading up to the time that he left, which I think was around 2011, 2012, again, it was really Marvel just trying everything. Because remember, they were coming out of the comic bust of the 90s. So it was just like, write it, print it. You know, if it sticks, we'll keep it. If it doesn't, we'll cancel it. And that was really the way they function in a lot of different ways. But it was also Quesada looking at the Marvel landscape and saying, let's change things up. Let's look at things that historically haven't worked and let's get rid of those. Let's reduce the mutant population because there's just too many of them right now. Let's focus on a core group of mutants. Let's do great storytelling instead of just having one-offs where some mutant shows up with some powers and they're never seen or heard from again. It was a lot of small things like that. And so this sort of uh, reinvigoration project, you know, again, stressed over the course of a decade and it was just something being tried. And then if it didn't work, an event would come along that would basically wipe that away. With the character of Matt Gargan and the Venom symbiote, that all really seemed to take place during Siege. And what I mean here is that Matt Gargan, the Scorpion, couldn't be Venom forever. It was literally Marvel just throwing the Venom symbiote on different people. In fact, during the events of Siege, there's a there's a section where Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, becomes Venom for a really short amount of time. But the idea was to basically look around and to say, where can we move this to? Now, of course, Flash Thompson had been really popular for quite some time, and that was the reason why Marvel basically went in the direction of taking the, the concept of the Venom symbiote and applying it to Flash Thompson, sending him forward as Agent Venom. It was basically the U.S. military taking the symbiote away from Scorpion and throwing it on Flash. That's why we're at this point right now where Scorpion is not Venom. Now, transitioning back to the story, there's actually there's actually a pretty funny moment when Spider-Man is again on this on this uh, ship fighting against uh, Scorpion at the same time. You have Alistair Smith and his various minions chasing after J. Jonah Jameson trying to take him out. And Spider-Man actually calls Avengers Mansion. The problem is that the person that he gets is Squirrel Girl. And it's hilarious because he was like, hey, put someone else, anyone else on. I don't care who it is, just not you. But it's kind of funny because like Squirrel Girl's never lost a fight. She's defeated everybody. She made Galactus a friend, you know, but she defeated Thanos. She's defeated everybody that she's fought against. She defeated Doctor Doom. She's really kind of like the one person you would want on your side. And that's sort of the irony about this, right? You know, it's the one character that's been, that's defeated everyone, but that no one takes seriously. And so it was kind of cool, you know, to, to see this little bit of a thing tapped in there. Plus it's this little banter back and forth between the two of them, you know, where Spider-Man's freaking out, you know, he was like, I'm, I'm literally on a ship fighting, you know, like I'm going to run out of oxygen soon if you do not help me out. And he just kind of cuts her off and she's like, there's always time for manners and that sort of thing. But in the end, he basically just kind of hangs up in the, in the middle of the call and, uh, and basically walks away. Now from here, we transition over to Dr. Octopus. And again, this is where Dan Slott was building everything up because in all these stories, we didn't really know what the grand plan of Dr. Octopus was. We didn't really know where this was going. All we knew was that Dr. Octopus would just show up periodically and have some plan. And that's why the whole Superior Spider-Man worked so well. Because instead of it being, you know, suddenly Dr. Octopus is in a comic and then three issues later, he's Peter Parker. Like it, it wasn't like that. Instead, it was like this gradual build over the course of some, you know, 20 volumes or 15 volumes that led up to this moment where he becomes Superior Spider-Man. So it was a really cool, slow build. And in my mind, those are always the best ones. The ones that build up slowly that lead to this really, really cool situation that allows us to kind of go forward with the status quo being changed. But uh, the issue here is, of course, for the most part, Dr. Octopus looks at this and says, you know, I need, I need Horizon Labs mission to be successful for whatever my grand plan happens to be. But with Alistair Smythe, his forces had essentially screwed up the control systems of the shuttle. And so Dr. Octopus 
octopus basically fixes them. It allows the shuttle to basically just kind of take off the way that it's supposed to. And with Spider-Man in free fall, he's rescued by Carol Danvers. Now, this is when we have the introduction of the rest of the new Avengers alongside a few members of the Fantastic Four. I think it's really only Ben Grimm now that I think about it, but it's kind of cool to see this team up because for a story like this, Dan Slott played it pretty smart. I mean, something like Spider Slayer, you know, Alistair Smith, we don't need like the full contingent of the Avengers and the full contingent of the Fantastic Four and the X-Men. We don't need that. That'd be overkill in the extreme. It's always cool to see them team up, but there has to be some measure of practicality when you're writing a story, you know, especially when it comes to Spider-Man, because in a lot of ways, as capable as he is, he's very much a street level hero in the sense that he'll, he'll go off and save the world. But nine times out of 10, his own personal stories see him dealing with things on the ground level. There aren't very many, you know, at least not right now anyway. Uh, I wouldn't say there are very many Spider-Man stories where he's off like fighting in space, different things like that. You see those from time to time in big crossovers, but his stories are usually pretty street level. So to grab a lot of these street level characters, you know, to grab Luke Cage, to grab Jessica Jones, to grab Iron Fist, you know, Carol Danvers and Ben Grimm being really the only two major powerhouses here works out pretty well. It's, it really kind of gives you the idea of the balance of the, the new Avengers landscape itself. But from here, this is when we start to get into Dan Slott kind of thinning the herd in terms of the roster of the uh, of the Amazing Spider-Man title in the sense that we basically have uh, Marla Jameson and we have Aunt May spending, you know, kind of a spa weekend together. Now, for those of you guys who are reading Clone Conspiracy, for J. Jonah Jameson seeing the return of Marla, this is the story where she dies. This is the story where she basically perishes and that's why it was so huge. But I hope that with this, this video, you guys are kind of starting to see how, you know, all the Amazing Spider-Man stuff just spins out of Dan Slott's run and it's just one great big giant cohesive story. It's not like it's a whole bunch of disconnected one shots or volumes, like it, it tells one great big cohesive adventure. And that's why I really love Dan Slott's run, to be honest. Like, I really enjoy his Spider-Man writing, especially what's going on right now. But, you know, with Alistair Smythe's forces, you know, breaking into the spa facility, we basically have, you know, Aunt May and, and, and uh, Marla, you know, hiding out as best they can, trying to keep from getting caught up in the conflict. And that's really just the nature of this battle, right? I mean, it's, it, I wouldn't say it's a battle that stretches across the entire city, but it is a battle that is uh, that's stretching into some, some heavily populated areas. Now, at the same time, Spider-Man also comes to the realization that the communication systems between uh, Alistair Smythe and his forces that they're not actually beings. Instead, they're basically cybernetic organisms in a lot of ways. There are characters like, uh, you know, like Scorpion that are actual people who have cybernetic modifications given to them by Alistair Smythe. But for the most part, it's basically a, a communication system that has to be taken down. So what he does is he races back to Horizon Labs for the purpose of constructing a device. The problem with this is that when he arrives, Max Modell is there. And Max Modell says, look, I want to talk to you about Spider-Man and I want to talk to you about Peter Parker. Now, the way that Dan Slott does this is actually kind of cool. He, he sort of messes with us a little bit in the sense that it's like Max Modell knows that Peter Parker's Spider-Man, but it's like he pretends not to know. Now, Dan Slott doesn't tell us that. That's just kind of how I interpreted this. And the reason why is because Max Modell says, look, you know, I know about you and Spider-Man. And, you know, because of the fact that you disappear every time Spider-Man shows up, it leads me to only one logical conclusion that you, basically Spider-Man hires you to build his weaponry and gadgets. Now, this seems almost like one of those things, like one of those situations where somebody basically like Max Modell's covering for Peter Parker. He's like, hey man, like I know about you and Spider-Man. And Peter Parker's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, I know as smart as I am. I know that Spider-Man hires you to do his weaponry, right? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That's the kind of, that's, that's the way it seems to come across. So it's like the official story is that he hires you to, to do his weaponry. Now, again, whether or not Max Modell actually knows at this point right now is kind of left ambiguous. Instead, you know, Max Modell basically rolls with the punches and says, hey, look, if what Spider-Man is looking to do is to have a device that will disrupt the communication systems, the, the biomagnetic communication systems between Alistair Smythe and his cybernetic creations, then, you know, I can help you achieve that. The problem with this is that it's literally going to disrupt the bioelectric field. And so what that means is that anybody caught in the blast, if they have any kind of enhanced abilities, you know, anything like that, they're going to lose those abilities. It's basically Max Modell saying, if Spider-Man is caught in the blast, you know, he'll lose some of his spider abilities. Now, how much he'll lose or whether or not he'll lose everything is unknown but it will physically impact him. And so because of that, we basically have, you know, Spider-Man returning to the conflict, uh, facing off against, you know, all these different forces of, of Alistair Smith, sort of, you know, leading everybody away. And that's, that's, that's really the case. It's everybody kind of making a mad dash, trying to get away as best they can. You know, you have Robbie Robertson, who's talking with, uh, with, with Jessica Jones and Carol Danvers and says, hey, look, you know, these things are here for me because they're going after J. Jonah Jameson. Get me out of here and everybody else around here will be safe. And of course they whisk him away. At the same time with May, uh, with, with J. Jonah Jameson being mayor, his motor Cade is getting him out of New York and getting him to New Jersey, but he's still being followed. And so because of this, Peter Parker in his conflict against the Scorpion basically activates this bioelectric EMP more or less. And when he does, it just, it seems to scramble the brain of Peter Parker, not in the sense that like he loses his 
memories and everything, but in the sense that it impacts him in some form or fashion, but he doesn't quite know how. At the same time, it also impacts, uh, it impacts uh, Scorpion. And the issue is that, you know, in, in the aftermath of all this, that really Peter Parker's forced to kind of face off directly against Alistair Smith as the Spider Slayer. And this is when we learn the impact that it has, that Spider-Man has basically lost his spider sense. He's not alerted to when, an, when, an, when a, a threat is coming. Now, on the surface, it's just kind of like, well, he's still, you know, that's not a huge deal. He's still got super strength and he's got super speed and so on and so forth. But the spider sense is what made Spider-Man unique. That's why, you know, if you, if you look at anybody who says, hey, give me like, the 10 most powerful heroes, the 10, you know, most capable superheroes in Marvel Comics, a lot of people will always put Spider-Man up there. And it's not because of the fact that he has strength, different things like that. I mean, even if he wasn't pulling his punches, he's not as strong as like the Sentry. He's not as strong as like Hyperion. He's not as fast as either. You know, he basically has your run of the mill superpowers. The spider sense is what made him so capable because that's what allowed him to dodge attacks. That's what allowed him to, you know, have some measure of knowing what the enemy was going to do before they did it. It didn't mean he could read minds, but it means he could react before they even laid a hit in the first place. It always kept him one step ahead. But if he doesn't have that, then he's just like a guy with super strength and super speed and he can climb walls and that's it. But the cool thing about this, or at least what seems to happen here anyway, is that in the middle of this fight, Alistair Smith kind of makes this last ditch effort to try to take out J. Jonah Jameson, but Marla jumps in the way. Now, Peter Parker is able to use the distraction to basically pummel Alistair Smith, but the problem is that with Marla basically killed, J. Jonah Jameson, or at least the final words that she says to him is don't blame other people you know don't don't spend your life being angry don't spend your life being hateful don't blame spider-man you know just blame alistair smith he's the one that did this but in the end j jonah jameson doesn't do that instead jonah jo uh, j jonah jameson says that it's not spider-man's fault it's not alistair smith's fault or smith's fault it is j jonah jameson's fault it's his own fault for putting her in harm's way like this because it's j jonah jameson looking at his past actions and basically saying they're all coming back to haunt him all the tabloids all the, the articles that he published in the daily bugle all the things that he said about all these villains and so on and so forth it was only a matter of time before they came back to haunt him and when they did it was going to end up taking away something that he valued a lot and it ultimately ended up being his wife marla all right, so picking up with the return of Anti-Venom, or I guess really, you know, the Amazing Spider-Man is really what we're doing. Again, this is all part of Dan Slott's run, and this is the cool thing, is because Dan Slott, again, you know, used the, the early aspects of his run to clean out a lot of the stuff that he didn't really care for with regards to this whole committee-ran Amazing Spider-Man series. And so because of that, you know, the, the return of Anti-Venom is designed to really just deal with Martin Lee. Now, again, we had talked, you know, before about how Martin Lee was one side of the same coin. You know, you had the Martin Lee personality, and you had the Mr. Negative personality. Mr. Negative knew about Martin Lee, but Martin Lee didn't know about Mr. Negative. Of course, Martin Lee being a legitimate guy, a guy that basically ran a, uh, a charity center, but Mr. Negative was this, you know, Mr. Hyde persona kind of thing, where he basically used the charity, uh, charity center as a front for drug running, money laundering, all these criminal schemes that he could basically run out of New York. Now, this also deals a lot with anti-venom in the sense that Eddie Brock is looking to basically eliminate Martin Lee because he considers Martin Lee to be a cancer on the society itself. Now, a lot of this really just, or at least the, the way the story initially picks up is the whole idea that, that anti-venom just kind of busts in in the middle of a uh, of a drug bust or I'm sorry of a drug deal by Martin Lee's guys and uh, starts to take them all out. The problem is that part way through this we're actually met by the arrival of the Wraith. Now this is kind of a weird situation here because the Wraith was a character that predates Dan Slott you know really like one more day predates that by maybe 20 years or something like that. The Wraith that you know Brian DeWolf originally appeared in like 1985 I want to say it was Peter Parker the spectacular Spider-Man or something like that. He appeared quite some time ago. He was a uh, Sal Buscema creation and maybe a Bill Mantlo creation, but basically he was just kind of one of these, these aspects of bolstering the Spider-Man mythos, adding new characters in. He was a vigilante with psionic powers, and there's a whole weird origin story that goes into him, but he was kind of like this on-again, off-again ally. At the same time, the Brian DeWolf persona that we knew was basically killed off in The Punisher, and so the, the idea here is, what in the heck is going on? Who is this version of the Wraith, which is kind of crazy? Now, of course, Dan Slott teases us a little bit when one of the people asks, like, who are you? You know, one of these guys asks, who are you? What are you doing here? And this person says, well, I'll reveal my identity, but we never find out what it is. Instead, we just kind of switch over to uh, to Anti-Venom as he takes out the last of these guys, finally tracks down where it is the Wraith has gone, only to discover that this is Gene DeWolf. Now, this being Gene DeWolf should technically be impossible because Gene DeWolf is dead. Like, she was she was shot. Of course, she was the sister of Brian DeWolf, the original Wraith. Uh, she was a detective that worked alongside Peter Parker uh, as Spider-Man for quite some time. She was an ally to a lot of the superhero community she was almost like this this misty knight-esque 
character, except where Misty Knight was kind of like an information broker for, you know, street level heroes and so on and so forth. Uh, Gene DeWolf kind of operated by passing information from within the police precinct itself to keep superheroes on the up and up to let them always know what the police are doing, what they're trying to track down so that superheroes could go track down these crimes, you know, and, and deal with people if they didn't think the police could pull it off on their own. The problem is that with Gene DeWolf being dead and most everybody knowing that she's dead, the question is, who is this chick? <laughs> who is this girl? Now, from here again, we jump back to uh, to Peter Parker. This is always kind of a cool thing because again, you know, Dan Slott tells us, hey, look, Carly Cooper does not know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. She has no idea about this. Instead, she's just like, yeah, Peter Parker, like, congratulations on your big day. Now, we don't know what the big day is. Something big is apparently happening at Horizon Labs, and it's kind of cool because Dan Slott toys with this. Peter Parker goes and meets with uh, with Max Modell. You know, he shows Max Modell an experiment or I guess an object he's been working on, a helmet that can withstand virtually any kind of collision without damage to it. Um, It's just like a lot of these things that are, that are sort of going on with his own individual character. But then we find out that the big day is that Peter Parker was published in American Science Journal. And what this does is it gives a lot of legitimacy to Peter Parker. He's like, yeah, I've hit it big time. Like, um, it's, it's, it's really funny because it's like Peter Parker's getting all the things that he hoped for. And instead of just being this kid who's selling photographs to the Daily Bugle, playing it day by day, trying to be a superhero, being broke all the time, trying to balance, you know, romance and so on and so forth, that he's actually hitting it big time. He's actually achieving all the goals that he set out to achieve. Now, the funny thing here, too, is that he, he talks to Aunt May and Aunt May is like, oh, you're an American Science Journal? It's like, well, that's nice. It's like the it's like the, the grandma's response to being, you know, to you being happy about something that they don't understand. But then we find out that she understands perfectly, that she actually printed off a ton of copies or ordered a ton of copies, and she's been handing it out to everybody in the feast shelter. She's like, yeah, like my nephew was an American Science Journal. Like, it's, <laughs> it's so cool and it's so exciting. But of course, again, because of the fact that Anti-Venom knows that the whole Martin Lee, Mr. Negative persona is operating out of the feast shelter because he's using it as a, as a way to basically run drugs, to engage in human trafficking, different things like that. He's basically operating in this location, albeit in a disguise, in order to figure out what's going on to make a move here. Now, of course, with regards to Martin Lee being guarded by his inner demons, uh, Martin Lee actually goes to visit, or at least goes out to shake the hand of Aunt May to thank her for all of her work. But then this is when we get a really cool situation. Somewhere along the line, Aunt May had witnessed Martin Lee killing one of his henchmen. And her reaction was, oh my God, I've got to tell somebody about this. But then Martin Lee had basically touched her and wiped her mind so that she didn't recall the incident. Now, of course, this causes Aunt May to pass out. And what this does is this puts a bit of a panic in the situation, right? I mean, it puts kind of a kink in the wheel because now Peter Parker's responding to, you know, the whole incident with Aunt May while at the same time trying to be a superhero. And that's really, that's, that's really how things go when it comes to the character. With every, you know, single Spider-Man story, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's like, oh, Aunt May's been injured again. You know, we gotta, we gotta get her off to the hospital and Peter Parker's gotta respond. It's not always that situation. But with every Spider-Man story, there's always a scenario that's injected where it kind of puts a bit of panic into the situation like, will Peter Parker make it there in time? That's one of the reasons why a lot of fans still love Spider-Man stories so much, or at least loved it in the early days when uh, Dan Slott started writing it, is because it maintained a lot of the older themes of Spider-Man, you know, from the era when his character was so popular and remained so popular because it was this idea that it's like, will Spider-Man get there in time? You know, with this, this whole situation. But during this, it's also Dan Slott showing us, again, where Eddie Brock stands. That's the cool thing. You know, whether it was Zeb Wells, who was writing, you know, the, the whole uh, Anti-Venom Punisher team up, whether it is Dan Slott when he originally introduced Anti-Venom to the Spider-Man mythos, it was Eddie Brock trying to be a good guy. And what he does is he kind of chastises himself for not acting sooner. He's like, I should have done something sooner. I should have acted sooner. Otherwise, Aunt May would never have been in danger. And that's kind of the kicker here is because with Aunt May being as old as she is, this could result in her dying. Like this could, this could result in her death because she's old, she's fragile. You know, she's almost done with all her living as it is. Something like this could result in her being killed. And so of course, you know, Anti-Venom kind of jumps into the whole situation, right? You know, and again, this is Dan Slott saying, hey guys, let's let's just kind of engineer a situation where Spider-Man and Anti-Venom fight one another. Because again, Spider-Man and Anti-Venom teaming up to a degree was only situational in the sense that it was Spider-Man not really knowing what Anti-Venom was about, just knowing that Eddie Brock was claiming to try to be a good guy. But in this moment, when Spider-Man arrives on the scene and Anti-Venom is tearing open the roof of a car with Martin Lee inside, Spider-Man's reaction is Martin Lee's a good guy. Martin Lee is the, the head of the, of the feast shelter. That guy's not a criminal, that guy's a legitimate dude. And so in his mind, Eddie Brock's reverted back to being a criminal again. And so of course, this just kind of dissolves down into a fight between the two. And they just, you know, they just sort of start going at it. And it's actually kind of cool to see them, you know, going against one another. Because remember, with Anti-Venom, whenever he's in the vicinity of Peter Parker, he sends his powers all into Cattywampus. So they just kind of start going crazy. And so because of that, Peter starts losing a lot of his abilities, being unable to tap into them, being unable to be as efficient as he normally is. And it's just a way for Dan Slott to basically introduce Anti-Venom in a, in a fashion that gives him kind of an upper hand on uh, on Peter Parker. And that's why it's cool. 
cool is because anti-venom keeps saying the entire time like i'm trying to be a good guy i'm trying to be a good guy just listen stop fighting me and just listen you know and so finally he gets the upper hand on peter parker right i mean martin lee makes his escape you know his guys get away finally he gets his hands on peter parker and he basically takes him captive the problem is that eddie brock takes him to what used to be a meth lab <laughs> And it's kind of messed up because Peter Parker's like, dude, it smells funny in here. He's like, well, the people that ran this before, they were running a meth lab and uh, I ran them all out, but I'm putting you here now to just basically keep you out of the way. <laughs> you know, of course, again, because of the fact that anti-venom's webbing is filled with the antibodies that his body houses in order to give him his powers, Spider-Man can't just break out. You know, he can't just escape by normal means. So the cool thing about this is Eddie Brock talks to him and says, look, man, Martin Lee is Mr. Negative. Like, you know who Mr. Negative is. You, you've never been able to catch him, but you know who Mr. Negative is. He's this warlord of Chinatown. You know, this running all these these drugs and people and, and money laundering and all this kind of stuff the reason why you've never caught him is because he's martin lee because when you like you've seen him a million times you just didn't know it was him now of course peter parker's response is well this is ridiculous like there's no way that that's the case but the other thing to remember here is that peter parker doesn't have a spider sense remember he lost that and so it wasn't like he you know came across mr lee and his spider sense activated he didn't have any way to know he just kind of has to take eddie brock at his word and that's why peter losing his spider sense is kind of cool here you know because if it turned out that he did have a spider sense and he came across Martin Lee, it would have almost immediately kicked off. Because remember, Martin Lee in this part of the story is Mr. Negative just posing as Martin Lee. And so he's still a bad guy. And Peter Parker's spider sense would have immediately tipped him off to that and been like, oh, well, Mr. Negative's here, you know? And so it really creates this cool situation where Spider-Man just kind of has to trust Eddie Brock. Now, of course, Eddie Brock doesn't do anything to benefit himself in this situation. He leaves Peter Parker tied up to a pole in what used to be a meth lab and then races off to try to find Martin Lee. The funny thing, and this is why, this is why I love the Spider-Man comics so much, the way Dan Slott wrote him. The funny thing about this is that Peter Parker's trying to make his escape, right? Like he has to grab acetone and he basically just kind of has to burn himself, you know, as he's trying to get himself out of this spider suit. The problem is that by the time he does, uh, by the time he burns himself and gets himself out of the suit, Anti-Venom shows up and puts, puts the, uh, you know, starts covering him in webbing again. And so he's like, really? Like I just went through all this only to turn around and be covered in this goo yet again. And it's just kind of, it's that Parker luck. It's just one of those inconvenient moments i guess but from here uh we pick up with with uh with carly cooper because again you know carly cooper is just kind of watching all these events unfold she's kind of you know trying to figure out what's going on with regards to all these sightings of the wraith these rumors that gene de wolf is alive again now, this is cool because it gives us this other part of the story that we wouldn't normally see but what happens is carly cooper you know being as smart as she is says look ghosts don't have body heat they just don't have body heat that's not the way it works and so when she's uh, when she's witnessing the wraith who's basically you know kind of tormenting a guy for the purpose of trying to trying to gain information on what it is that Mr. Negative is doing next. Carly Cooper is watching all the events unfold and she says that's an actual person. That's not, there's no way that's Gene DeWolf. And if it is, then how did she come back from the dead? And so it's just like, that's got to be somebody posing as Gene DeWolf. I want to know who that person is. Now, following this whole trail of what's going on with regards to the Wraith, we kind of follow Carly Cooper as she goes through this whole, you know, process of trying to figure out what's going on with Gene DeWolf. And that's one of the reasons why this is kind of cool is because it's like this little intricate goodie of a side story and, and with regards to this whole uh, this whole telling and what we find out is carly cooper goes to a place called the special crimes evidence storage and what this is is basically a location where they store things you know like the glider of green goblin bombs and you know mysterious tech and so on and so forth just super villains whose uh gears and gadgets have been confiscated by the police after their arrest the problem with this is that carly cooper is basically told by the officer on the scene that evidence from that place doesn't go missing instead that it was destroyed that there was a pumpkin bomb that had went off and all the evidence was completely obliterated but as carly cooper is going through and looking at all this she comes to the realization that there was only one person who was around that evidence room at the time of the accident and that was captain yuri watanabe and so the idea here is that a member of the police force in new york is masquerading as the wraith which is actually kind of cool it's actually kind of an interesting concept here it's not wildly important it's not the most important thing by any stretch of the imagination it's just kind of interesting but from here we switch back to the metropolitan museum of art with peter parker and anti-venom of course anti-venom says hey look this is where they're doing their whole meeting this is where they're doing their next drug meeting you know i'm putting you here out of sight because i want you to see this i want you to see that martin lee is mr negative now the funny thing about this is that mr negative has a muramasa blade which is designed for the purpose of disrupting people's healing factors healing abilities and it disrupts healing abilities regardless of where those abilities come from because remember when it comes to healing factors in marvel comics whether it's wolverine deadpool dakin x23 the symbiotes it doesn't matter all the healing happens on a cellular level and so what the muramasa blade does is it 
it basically just blocks people, you know, blocks their cells from being able to regenerate. And so because of this, you know, with Martin Lee showing up here, with, you know, with a mystic blade attacking anti-venom, uh, as long as the blade's in his body, he's not going to be able to heal from his attacks. The kicker to all this is that while Peter Parker is being held here by anti-venom, well, then suddenly we have Wraith showing up. And that's kind of the funny thing is, is Peter Parker, you know, Spider-Man hadn't really been investigating the whole Wraith thing, didn't really even know it was going on. Instead, Wraith is just here. And the whole idea is that he basically says, look, lady, like you're, you're telling me you're a ghost. You know, that's fine. I've met spirits of vengeance. All right. I've met Ghost Rider. I've seen people come back from the dead. I know what ghosts are. I know the difference. You're not a ghost. You're using technology from Mysterio is what you're doing. And that's a funny thing because the Wraith is like, oh, ooh, I'm the Wraith. I'm spooky. You know, and she's being all like mysterious cloak and dagger. And he's like, yeah, you're using Mysterio's tech, right? And like a couple other gadgets, some stuff like that. And then Wraith is just kind of like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's just a funny situation because it's like the Wraith is using all the technology that Peter Parker's seen before when he's fought his various villains. So it's nothing new to him. You know, it's just kind of like that's... You're just using stuff that I've seen before. It's just somebody else doing it. Now, of course, the allegiance, the alliance is, is short-lived. I mean, only in so far that it lasts long enough for Peter Parker and Wraith to join forces with Anti-Venom and take out, you know, Mr. Negative's guys, which they, you know, for the most part succeed in doing, you know, taking him out pretty easily. The issue with this is that, of course, you know, he ends up throwing his death gas, you know, a poison gas that will basically take most people out. But in response to this, of course, you have Peter Parker who basically gets the upper hand in this major conflict and where uh, Mr. Negative seems to make his escape and he's seems to get away, a uh, Wraith ends up using the technology in her suit to basically analyze the face of Mr. Negative, do a side-by-side -side comparison with a 97% accuracy match to verify that Antivenom was telling the truth, that Mr. Negative is Martin Lee. And so because of that, Spider-Man's basically just kind of forced to trust Antivenom. Like, well, I guess he was right. You know I mean? I guess he was right when he said that, like, Mr. Negative was Martin Lee. And the result is that he ends up going forward, having to, to not really trust Eddie Brock, so to speak, but give him a little more credence than he originally gave him. In addition to this, the face of Martin Lee and Mr. Negative just kind of plastered all over the place. I mean, it's sent out to Frontline, it's sent out to the Daily Bugle, it's put on the national news, the whole nine yards. And so everybody knows that Martin Lee and Mr. Negative are the same person, that they're basically criminals. And so because of that, it's more or less everything that Mr. Negative has worked for has essentially just come crashing down around him. And so because of that, you know, where Mr. Negative makes his escape, you know, where he's able to get away, this results in, again, this, this kind of mini alliance, so to speak. But it's also Carly Cooper tracking down Yuri Watanabe and saying, why did you decide to don the mask of Wraith? Why did you decide to, to go on and be this you know, vigilante character. Well, of course, Watanabe says, we were both friends of Jean DeWolf. We both know who she was. We were both friends of hers. She was shot in cold blood. It was a senseless murder. I wanted to basically carry on the mantle of the Wraith. I wanted people to believe that she was back. I wanted to inspire fear in the hearts and minds of individuals, which is actually kind of a cool concept. But in the end, uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a cool situation to see the Wraith return to a degree, but it doesn't have like any major bearing on events that go on. It's really just kind of part of this mini story in the background in order to kind of beef things up a bit, you know, in order to give it a little bit more than just, hey, Peter Parker doesn't know if he can trust Anti-Venom and now Anti-Venom's gonna prove him wrong. You know, it's just kind of adding a little bit of uh, information. But at the end of the day, things just kind of wind down with Peter Parker talking to Carly Cooper and uh, this idea that he may reveal his identity to her, but instead he doesn't. You know, where she keeps asking questions, where she keeps, you know, kind of poking and prodding about his relationship with Spider-Man, he basically offers the exact same explanation that he gave Max Modell when he's like, well, I'm not Spider-Man. I mean, he says, I basically just build Spider-Man's gadgets for him. And Carly Cooper takes it as gospel truth. She's like, I knew it. I knew that you were somehow involved with Spider-Man. This is kind of Dan Slott teasing that things may end up uh, becoming a little more interesting with regards to the relationship between the two. But again, at this point, we don't really know how that's going to flesh out. Okay, so Spider versus, I'm um, not Spider Verse. <laughs> Spider versus later. Spider Island is right around the corner. And in truth, Spider Island actually has a couple of like preludes. For those of you guys who don't know, whenever it comes to crossover events, whether it's line wide, which means it's like everybody, it goes through Avengers, X Men, and humans, the whole nine yards, or if it's just like a standalone story that pertains to a character or a group of people, there's usually always like a lead in. For example, with Civil War II, there was the road to Civil War II. With Civil War I, there was the road to Civil War I. They usually always have those, the road to secret invasion. There's always preludes that lead, in, uh, lead into it. Sometimes it's just like a whole bunch of stories. For example, the lead into Dark Reign was House of M, Avengers Disassembled, Civil War, Secret Invasion. I mean, it was everything leading up to Dark Reign. There were a lot of things going on. Um, Siege was a really good story that tied into Dark Reign. But with regards to, uh, to Spider Island, the best prelude I think that's offered is a story called Infested. And the reason why is because what this does is it tells us how it all starts. The prologue, so to speak, that is to say like Amazing Spider 
Spider-Man number 665, I think it is. It kind of goes into it, but it's not nearly as important, I don't think, as the infested story. So what this does is this picks up with Miles Warren. And the reason why is because it's the most logical person to choose. When it comes to the history of Marvel Comics and really in the Spider-Man mythos, Miles Warren, really his most significant role prior to this was Clone Saga. Despite the fact that that story was, was hated. I mean, it was panned. People hated that story <laughs> because it was basically Marvel introducing the notion of replacing Peter Parker with a clone Ben Riley. What was supposed to be a story that would basically uh, simplify the Spider-Man mythos turned out to be anything but. You go read any interview from anybody who was part of that project and they were like, the story was supposed to be short. And before we knew it, the whole damn thing just spiraled out of control to the point that it was basically insane and people hated it. <laughs> but Miles Warren was the guy who was behind the cloning of Peter Parker. He knew Peter Parker's identity. He basically created a Kane. He eventually created Ben Riley. And so the idea was that if Dan Slott's going to come back and he's going to have someone give everybody in Manhattan spider powers, Miles Warren is the most logical person to choose. Now, what Miles Warren does is he basically goes through and begins adding or begins modifying the uh, the DNA of bed bugs with spider DNA, or basically giving people the ability to have spider powers by way of being bitten by these bed bugs. And again, that makes sense because bed bugs are small. They're not something that you normally look for. At least if you if you basically engage in any measure of cleanliness, you don't expect to look for bed bugs. And so because of this, they basically just kind of pour into the city of Manhattan. Now, what this does is it gives us like a series of these little two or three issue stories, and we'll cover them all here, but it gives us an uh, a series of these little two or three issue stories that follow each individual person when they're granted these spider powers and how they respond. And it's actually really, really cool. One of the first people that we pick up with is a guy by the name of Richard Davies. Now, it's kind of ironic here because Richard Davies is, for all intents and purposes, Flash Thompson. I mean, the way that his character is portrayed here, he's basically the, the jock or something like that. He's picking on the guy who's basically the nerd. It creates an interesting situation here. And the reason why Dan Slott did this is because when it comes to the Spider-Man mythos, it's timeless, right? I mean, Spider-Man is timeless. A kid who basically was bitten by a radioactive spider, you know, he learned that with great power comes great responsibility. That lesson was learned at the expense of his uncle's life. You know, it's it's a beautifully crafted, crafted story and it's the most recognizable. Thank God they're not going over that origin story again in Spider-Man Homecoming. <laughs> that was like everybody's biggest fear. They were going to go over it again, but it's, it's a timeless story. And so to kind of see it rehashed a little bit, it's interesting. Even then, Dan Slott says, if you ever want to see real life, if you want to see what people are really like, go to the schoolyard. Now, this is kind of an archaic stance that Dan Slott's taking, right? It's an older ideology. This was the 1980s. You know, maybe even the early 1990s, I'd say, Dan Slott, you're probably right. This is the 2000s. This is the the late 2000s. So if you're talking about people in their most basic form, <laughs> if you're talking about people in, in their most uh, fundamental form, that's the internet. When there's anonymity, people don't have to be, don't have to worry about being held accountable for the things they say and do. And so it's people in their most basic form. But the idea here is that this kid, there's a particular person that's being picked on. Richard Davies basically, you know, gains these uh, spider powers by way of a bite from one of these bed bugs. And then his spider sense goes off when he realizes that the guy he's picking on has a gun and he intends to shoot Richard Davies. Now, of course, Richard Davies is able to counter, he uses a super strength, and he attacks this guy and kills him in the process. And this is really, really cool because what this is, is Dan Slott drawing on the lessons learned from Ultimate Spider-Man. Remember, in the first arc, which Comic Story is covering right now, you know, one of the, in, the, in the very beginning of Ultimate Spider-Man, one of the first lessons Peter Parker had to learn was that, there were, that he basically has to pull his punches, that if he didn't pull his punches, he would kill people. And so because of that, he basically had to come to this realization that he can't just go full in when it comes to fighting various supervillains that he has to fight supervillains with a, with you know being cogn uh, cognizant of what he's capable of. Richard Davies wasn't raised with that lesson. He wasn't taught how to use his powers. It's just suddenly he has the spider sense. He just kind of snaps into action. He reflexes and he kills this kid in the process. And the response is that Richard Davies is basically on the run. He's, he's a fugitive hiding from the police and he's wanted for murder. Now, at this point, we switch over to another guy. And the person that we join is Walter Coleman. Now, Walter, Walter Coleman is kind of like this predecessor to renew your vows. And that was a really interesting thing here because remember, in the world of comics, everything has happened before and it'll all happen again. It's basically the same thing. Stories just get recycled. Every story that can be told has been told. There's a reason why we're seeing Superman with the sun for the first time now, because in his 70 some odd year history, we've never seen that before. It's new, it's fresh, but after a while, that story will have been told. Where do you go from there? And so what we do here is with Walter Coleman, he takes this kind of renew your vow stance. The reason why I say that is because during the events of Secret Wars, Marvel released the story, you know, Spider-Man renew your vows. And what it was, was kind of like this, this throwback to fans who really wanted to see Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson get back together, and they wanted to see how that life would function. With Renew Your Vows, it was basically Peter Parker walking away from being a superhero. A new villain named The Region had shown up on the scene. He was basically kidnapping uh, superheroes. He was using them, keeping them prisoner in the process. 
And the result was that during this massive battle between what was left of the Avengers and uh, and Regent himself, Peter Parker had to choose between Mary Jane and his and his you know his family or fighting alongside the Avengers. He chose Mary Jane, he left the Avengers behind, and he basically had to hide. He had to, to basically pretend that he wasn't a superhero. His family had to follow the exact same pattern. This very much takes the same approach, and we get these really cool juxtapositions between characters, between super, I'm sorry, between uh, Spider-Man and between Walter Coleman. Where Spider-Man is basically saving people from burning buildings, so on and so forth, Walter Coleman is basically had to watch his neighbors burn to death. And the reason why is because he said, look, I got these powers, I have these abilities. Yes, I could have saved their lives, but I'm a family man. I've got a family to protect. You know, I'm sorry about their luck. That's their problem. You know, I take care of my family first. And that makes sense. You know, I mean, if, if you're a person and your, your family's struggling financially, you know, and your kids are hungry, you don't fix a sandwich for the family across the street. You fix a sandwich for your kids. You keep your house in order. You take care of your house. And then you worry about those guys across the street. And if they don't make it, that's their problem, not yours. And so the whole idea here is that it gives us this really, really cool situation. It gives us this very real world, how people should normally function type of situation. And it comes out kind of cool. But in the end, this is just another instance where a person just uses their powers or really doesn't use their powers and takes it in a completely different direction. But at this point, we switch over to a guy named Matteo Cauldron, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Uh, but again, this is a guy who basically is just, you know, supplying drugs. He's just, he's, he's basically a drug dealer. That's really it, you know, just a drug runner here. And he's fighting, uh, fighting Cloak and Dagger. There's no real huge story here. It's basically just that Cloak and Dagger are beginning to realize that people are popping up on the scene that have the powers of Spider-Man. And it creates a really interesting situation because for them, they don't quite know how to handle this. Remember, when it comes to Peter Parker, facing off against him is a very dangerous situation because, I mean, right now, he doesn't have a spider sense. Of course, we saw that with Spider-Man big time. He lost his spider sense. But for those individuals that do have it, the spider sense is what keeps Spider-Man on top. If you take Spider-Man's spider sense away, well, then he's just got the same power that everybody else has. He's got super strength, super speed, durability, and he can crawl on walls, which is kind of cool, and he can shoot webbing. But that's it. I mean, you know, without a spider sense, he can't be alerted to danger. So all it would take is the Punisher sitting on top of a roof a hundred yards away and Peter Parker's not with us anymore. That's all it really takes. I mean, we saw that during Original Sin, right? You know, during the whole Original Sin story when Nick Fury was established as being the man on the wall where he was basically taking care of threats within the Earth and beyond the Earth, when Peter Parker first popped up, Nick Fury was going to kill him. And that time period between when Peter Parker first became Spider-Man before his spider sense fully developed and he began to understand how it works, Nick Fury came across him, was sitting on a rooftop, took aim and planned to kill him. But then Nick Fury said, well, no, I think this is a good guy. And Peter Parker lived. It was one of those really cool retcons where it was like, you know, Peter Parker was a bullet. Well, I'm sorry, was a was a trigger pull away from being killed. And so it was a, a really cool situation. But again, from here, we switch over to uh, to, to uh, Shang-Chi. There we go. <laughs> and Shang-Chi is basically like Bruce Lee in the Marvel Universe. I mean, I have a hard time finding anybody who would refute that claim. That's basically what he is. It's cool. I love Shang-Chi. He's a really cool character, but he's basically Bruce Lee in the, uh, in the Marvel Universe universe. But the issue here is that remember, because Peter Parker doesn't have his spider sense, he has to essentially rely on other means to begin getting around his guys the way he normally would. Because, you know, with, with Peter Parker, I wouldn't say his spider sense was a crutch so much as I would say his spider sense was an intrinsic part of who he was. You know, it was an arm, it was a leg, it was a it was a foot, you know, it was it was a fist. It was very much an intrinsic part of what his character was. He relied on his spider sense as much as he relied on his agility, his webbing, all that kind of good stuff. To have it taken away means that now he has to be able to compensate. And this is cool because what he does is he develops his own martial arts style called the way of the spider. <laughs> the sad thing is that he uses it twice in Spider Island. And I don't think we ever see it again. That's the saddest thing about this because he basically gets the spider sense back. and He's like, well, I don't really need that anymore. You know, and that's it. And it, it, it kind of sucks, you know, but the cool thing is that, you know, with regards to this whole training sequence, he's really learning from one of the greatest martial artists in the entirety of the, uh, of the Marvel universe. But what we do is we pick up, you know, again, this is really, really fast. We pick up with a few days after this training session, or I guess over the course of these training sessions, sessions with Spider-Man leaving, and we find out that all of this is being watched by the new Madam Web, Julia Carpenter. Now, the concept of Madam Web is interesting in the realm of Spider-Man. Remember, when Dan Slott took over the title, you know, everything, really, I guess the, the role of Spider-Island was kind of grabbing all these different stories that were leading up to it, grabbing all these things in the Spider-Man mythos and saying, here's what I want to keep, here's what I don't want to keep, and Spider-Island served the purpose of just getting rid of everything that Dan Slott didn't want to keep, you know, getting rid of all that stuff. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to Spider-Island, but Madam Web was kind of like this holdover from an earlier time in, in Spider-Man comics, but Madam Web is tied intrinsically into
into the web of life and destiny or destiny and life, whatever you call it. And that's where people seem to get confused in, in Marvel Comics and the Spider-Man mythos. That was a huge point in Spider-Verse. A lot of people were thrown off by the web of destiny and life. So let's let's talk about this for a second because this is more important than Madam Web. <laughs> Madam Web is just like an oracle. All right, she can just see the future. That's all she can do. It's cool, whatever. She's a plot device in, in Spider-Island. So um, the, the web of life and destiny is this really cool thing because in Marvel Comics, every group, every subgroup of superheroes has its own kind of access to the multiverse. And it's not like Marvel engineered it to be that way. It's not like in 1962 with Fantastic Four or whatever it was that Marvel, you know, that the Stanley and Jack Kirby sat down and said, okay, guys, over the course of the next 50 years, we're going to lay out multiversal access for these different individual teams. It just kind of progressed that way. It just kind of turned out to be that way. It's cool, but it turned out to be that way. For example, the British superhero team Excalibur has what's called the Lighthouse. And the Lighthouse is basically a portal, more or less. I mean, you know, you go into it, you can access the uh, Captain Britain Corps. That's what, you know, Brian Braddock does. He goes into the Lighthouse. He accesses the uh, Omniversal, Omniversal Development Corps, I think is what it's called, and uh, the Captain Britain Corps, this multiversal group of Captain Britons from across the multiverse. In the mutant landscape, you have what's called the Mkron Crystal. If you imagine the multiverse to be a hallway of doors, each door going to a different universe, the Mkron Crystal is that door. Each universe has its own Mkron Crystal. That's why if you were to destroy the Mkron Crystal in any given universe, it would be tantamount to blowing the door off the hinge, in which case all the energies of the multiverse would just come pouring in, and it would lead to the destruction of that uh, of that universe itself, and then eventually the multiverse would just condense in on itself and the multiverse would be destroyed. So uh, it's, it, it creates kind of a weird situation. And uh, in the realm of traditional superheroes, the Fantastic Four, the Avengers, so on and so forth, we have the negative zone. You know, in, in all the multiverse, there's only one negative zone, and any universe can access it. The Ultimate Universe can access it, the main Marvel Universe can access it. They all have access to the negative zone. The web of a uh, web of life and destiny is the exact same way. The difference here is that individuals who can tap into the web of, of life and destiny, or whatever you want to call it, can see the future. And that's the huge difference when it comes to all the other aspects of multiversal access, the lighthouse, the negative zone, the Mkron crystal, those individuals cannot see the future. The only exception to that, I think, is maybe the white phoenix of the crown, Jean Grey. But even then, I'm not going to swear to that. People who can who can basically access that can can end up seeing the future. So it creates kind of a, a really cool, uh, really cool situation with regards to the Spider-Man myth those. But yeah, I mean, the whole infested thing is really just designed to serve the purpose of saying, hey guys, here are the events that are leading up to it. You know, Madam Web is basically looking into the future and saying the spiders are coming. You know, there's going to be this great big huge conflict, this massive, you know, uh, calamity really, you know, of, of catastrophic proportions in New York, which we know is going to be Spider Island. Okay, so getting into Spider Island, uh, what I wanted to do was just go ahead and uh, and throw this this prologue in here anyway in this video. And the reason why is just because of the fact that th there are a few things here in this prologue that will be important with regards to the story. Not insane, not anything that we could like go without talking about. I mean, we could just cover it in the rest of the video, but I wanted to go ahead and just throw it in here anyway because it can't hurt. It beefs up the video <laughs> and it's never a bad thing. But the cool thing is that for the most part, when it comes to Spider-Man in this prologue, it's really just kind of like his goings on. It's really just like, here's what Spider-Man does when he does things. But it's also kind of Dan Slott saying, hey guys, there are some things going on in the background that at first don't seem relevant, but become relevant later on. Specifically, some guys who have committed some robberies. Now, the reason these guys committing these robberies is because they've become more brazen. With these Spider-Man powers, while they don't necessarily manifest right off the bat, they are becoming a little more adventurous. They are becoming a little more dangerous than they normally would be, because for them, they kind of feel like they're, they're indestructible, you know, just because of the fact that they basically have the same abilities as Spider-Man. Now, these criminals are wrapped up by Peter Parker Parker pretty fast. And of course, he just kind of races off just because of this New York. There's always a crime going on somewhere. And so for Peter Parker, he can't just linger around. He's just kind of like, okay, these guys are wrapped up. You know, the cops are here. We'll call it a day. I got to bail out. Now, the cool thing about this is we also pick up with J. Jonah Jameson. Now, keep in mind, Jameson's currently mayor of New York. The issue with this is that his approval ratings are at an all-time low. <laughs> and the reason why is because he hates Spider-Man and he makes no bones about the fact that he hates Spider-Man. Now, under normal circumstances, this wouldn't be a problem. But everybody in the city loves Spider-Man. Man. And so they hate the mayor because he hates Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of these funny, one of these funny little situations, but it's also J. Jonah Jameson on the other side of the coin, on the other side of the line, in the sense that when he was running the Daily Bugle, he was going through and just lambasting Spider-Man all the time. You know, Spider-Man sucks, Spider-Man's a menace, so on and so forth. It's one of the things that we loved about his character. Well, now the Daily Bugle is running these uh, these campaigns against J. Jonah Jameson. And so now he's like, well, I don't like being on the other side. It's not fair. You know, the Daily Bugle is wrong. It's just one of these 
things where it's like be damned with the facts my opinion's right but again you know a lot of this is just kind of peter doing his own thing it's him just kind of you know being a hero and doing whatever it is that he does in his in his normal time but one of these funny little moments that we get is in, in horizon labs and that's why i really like dan slot's writing because it's just the funny little moments that make the story so interesting with an experiment that he's basically you know showing to max modell and the rest of the guys at horizon labs max modell makes the comment that you can't tack the number 2000 to the end of something and it becomes cooler which i beg to differ like imagine comics explain 2000 like <laughs> explaining comics to you in the voice of morgan freeman <laughs> like it'd be pretty funny it'd be kind of cool but uh, it's just one of those funny little moments I mean, nothing too major but with regards to the whole leader with regards to this being like a tried and true prologue to the whole element of uh, of spider island this is when we start to see people manifesting abilities this comes in a couple different forms the first is through carly cooper the whole idea with carly is that while she's currently on the scene of this crime remember she's a forensic scientist she watches a couple of these criminals break free of their webbing this is something that should normally never be allowed to happen the webbing is designed to, to easily you know keep a, a normal human being contained the only individuals that can break out of peter parker's webbing are people with super strength and so this is dan slot saying their spider powers are starting to emerge they're basically gaining the abilities of spider-man now in response to this carly cooper immediately takes out one of these guys and this is dan slot telling us carly cooper now has super strength and that's the way this really begins to unfold is that these small little glimpses these small little drops in there of people gaining all these different abilities now from here we pick up with the jackal and we pick up with the jackal's henchman now again at this point we don't really know who this henchman is all we know is that he's just a guy that's there with the jackal and what jackal does is he presents a card to one of these people one of these uh, individuals who have developed spider powers and says be at this location tomorrow and so the idea is that there's a kind of gathering of sorts what the jackal will do with that we don't quite know yet but again switching over to the future foundation keep in mind all of this comes after hickman's fantastic four so because of that peter parker is still part of the future foundation that's still very much a role that he plays you know this kind of scientific community and it works out for his character because with peter parker is part of future foundation and is part of horizon labs it means he has access to all the science concepts that the future foundation is coming up with under reed richards the smartest man in the marvel universe and he can extend those to horizon labs so while i wouldn't say that he's a double agent it does allow him to cheat a little bit it does allow him to basically grab ideas that may not necessarily be his own that he's helped to contribute to and then roll them over into horizon labs but the issue with this is that while all this is happening individuals from around new york are manifesting spider powers they're manifesting spider abilities now the effects of this are wide and ranging i mean you know some people are only developing a spider sense and the powers come the, you know the strength and speed come later some people are developing strength and speed and the spider sense comes later but they're all having these kind of physical reactions and so to the doctors of new york there's some kind of virus that's going around that's infecting the city on a massive scale and no one quite knows how to handle it now at this point we pick up with the jackal again and we have him back in his laboratory of course you know where he's continuing to experiment and we basically have this woman who's in shadow now we'll find out who she is and it's actually going to be dan slot returning and then killing off an old character from uh <laughs> from from spider-man's like, really like the the holdover of old spider-man stories but what we find out is that someone's basically been kidnapped by the jackal and this person is being experimented on for the purpose of serving you know some kind of role some kind of uh you know i guess maybe being a powerhouse member of jackal's group but we also find out this unknown henchman of jackal is kane now this is really really interesting because when it came to the character of kane in marvel comics kane parker he made his debut in web of spider-man number 119 i think and he was basically part of clone saga the story everybody hates <laughs> but the idea is that kane was kind of like this holdover from clone saga that marvel just never really knew how to get rid of it was like marvel's dirty little secret like what do you do with a character like kane i mean after clone saga like there was nothing for him he was just kind of tumbling down the rabbit hole of stories and popping up every once in a while and just becoming increasingly irrelevant as time went on and so by the time it got around to spider island this is probably the most significant role that he plays leading into him becoming the second scarlet spider with scarlet spider volume 2 that story is amazing by the way i love scarlet spider with kane parker and i don't know how other people feel about it but i always thought it was really really enjoyable but we basically have this giant spider guy kind of manifesting but we also find out that this unknown woman's able to basically seize control of this spider guy you know whoever this giant you know monster is she's able to seize control of it and bend it to her will and so from here we basically pick up with this revelation that everybody in new york is developing spider powers they're able to shoot webbing they have super strength they have super speed they can crawl on walls they basically have all the abilities of spider-man but for the life of peter parker for his own individual goings-on carly cooper 
reveals the fact that she has Spider-Man's powers. Now, this is crazy. This is this is really, really interesting because what she does is she kind of tries to corner him a little bit, right? And say, hey, look, like you're friends with Spider-Man. Like you make all his gear because remember, that's kind of been the ongoing lie that Peter Parker has been telling everybody that begins to get close to the idea that he's Peter Parker, that he's Spider-Man. He basically says, well, no, 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 I'm not Spider-Man. It's just I helped to develop Spider-Man's gear, you know, all his different gadgets and all that kind of good stuff. I help him build that. And so that's the lie that Carly Cooper's been told and it's the lie that she believes. And so in response, her idea is, hey, look, like help me out. Like have me, you know, let me meet with Spider-Man so that we can start working together and he can teach me how to be a superhero. And that seems to be a lot of people's response to this. A lot of people seem to have this idea that they all want to be superheroes. Not only that, we end up meeting up with Miles Warren. We end up meeting up with a Jackal where he basically passed this note on to this guy as well as a multitude of other people show up at this location at a certain time. And the idea of Miles Warren is to cause absolute chaos, cause absolute uh, pandemonium in Bryant Park in New York by giving everyone who's there some variation of the Spider-Man costume. And all these costumes range from the earliest costumes that Peter Parker wore when he was Spider-Man to just, you know, costumes you can buy off the shelves all the way up to his future foundation costume. And so it's, it's again, no one really knows who Spider-Man is, which Spider-Man is the right Spider-Man. Now, of course, we have, remember, you have Aunt May, you have J. Jonah Jameson Sr. They're heading out to Boston, or at least they're sitting in an airport. They're not in New York right now. Remember, we had talked about that, that with regards to the whole prelude thing, it was the idea of basically ushering them out, removing them from the landscape and sort of shifting them away. That was the whole basis behind this. And so because of that, with all these different uh, folks unfolding, all these different folks popping up with these, you know, Spider-Man powers, the Avengers, the new Avengers, the mighty Avengers, everybody in New York begins to respond. Now, of course, this begs the question, where's like Excalibur at from Britain? I guess they're just kind of like, well, that's new, that, that ain't our problem. That's New York. We don't care. <laughs> I have no idea. But the cool thing is that when Peter Parker gets here, it's exactly what we would expect. I mean, you've got guys who are wearing the Iron Spider armor from Civil War. People who are wearing like the Spider-Man back in black suit. You know, you have people who are wearing the Spider-Man suit with the wings. You know, people who are wearing the, you know, again, the earliest versions. Every single costume that Spider-Man's ever worn exists in some form or fashion in all these people who have his outfit so that when the real Peter Parker shows up, no one knows it's him. No one believes it's him. And that's kind of the crazy thing here. That's what made Spider Island so interesting in the beginning was because Peter Parker's blessing turned out to be his curse. Remember, in Amazing Spider-Man number 641, following the events of Civil War, that Doctor Strange, or at least it had been revealed, that Doctor Strange had cast a spell at the request of Peter Parker that removed knowledge of his identity from the world when he unmasked himself during Civil War in order to lend credence to Tony Stark's claim that if superheroes came forward, they registered that there were secret identities would be safe, that their families would be safe, that following the Civil War event, Marvel had to find some way to put the genie back in the bottle again. And so that's exactly what happened. Doctor Strange said, okay, everybody, no one knows the identity of Peter Parker. The only way they can find out is if Peter Parker basically reveals it to them directly. That's the only way, or if they just happen to see him without his mask or something along those lines. But the issue is that when he shows up, the Avengers, the Mighty Avengers, the whole nine yards, they all start attacking him because in their mind, this isn't Peter Parker. This is just somebody with the powers of Spider-Man masquerading as Spider-Man. And so the fight goes exactly as we would expect it to in the sense of the the avengers and everybody is like hey man you gotta go <laughs> you gotta get out of here if you really are spider-man you need to leave because all you're doing right now is you're getting in the way now what also ends up happening here is that with carly cooper fighting on the front lines and going against you know some of these uh, some of these criminals fighting the small time guys not really facing off against villains peter parker ends up running into mary jane watson now the cool thing about this is remember mary jane watson knows that he's he's spider-man she's one of the few people that know his identity and her response is you have to get out there and you have to do something well, in the mind of Peter Parker, he's like, well, all the superheroes don't know that I'm Spider-Man. I can't just walk out and unmask myself. But he says, what I can do is I can rally the citizens of New York. Now, this is extremely important. And the reason why is because Peter Parker goes on camera, broadcasts to the internet and says, hey, if you guys are watching this, I have spider powers. I have a spider sense. I have all these different things. The New York that people believe they know is not the New York that it actually is. People think that everybody in New York are dicks. That's not true. You know, there are people in New York who are hard workers who believe in truth and fairness and justice in the American way. If you're one of those people, fight alongside me, be a superhero. And he basically rallies a whole ton of New Yorkers to his side. Now, this is actually kind of a cool revelation because this will be extremely important once we get back to the end of this video. But following this, you know, where Peter Parker is able to rally these guys to his cause, the next step is, okay, how do we cure this virus? How do we basically eliminate this entire, you know, this, this pathogen that's giving everybody superpowers? Now, the cool thing is that there are three individuals who are working diligently on this. Max Modell, the head of Horizon Labs, Reed Richards, and some unknown guy in cell number six. We don't know who that person is, but the cool idea is that with Reed Richards and Max Modell here, if anybody can find a solution, they can. Now, that's kind of the ironic thing about this is because what Dan Slott does 
and he says, hey, look, you've got two of the smartest men in the world, like Max Modell and Reed Richards working on a solution. Surely they're going to find a way to cure this, right? And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, I assume they are. You know, that's, that's something that would make sense. Well, then we shift over to anti-venom. Anti-venom is a ready-made cure. Remember, anti-venom is basically a venom symbiote with antibodies. He can cure any one of anything. And so he begins going through and basically chasing down all these individuals who have spider powers, whether they're villains or whether they're good guys, and starts stripping their abilities away from them, starts taking their abilities away from each and every one of these guys. And it creates kind of a funny situation because in our mind, it would be like, well, I mean, why don't they just go to anti-venom? <laughs> If he's the cure, why don't they just go to anti-venom? And so at this point, we end up joining uh, Peter Parker when he and Carly Cooper end up traveling again to uh, to the police precinct. Because remember, that's one of the one of the reasons why we covered a lot of these stories with Amazing Spider-Man. A lot of them seemed almost totally irrelevant, and most of them were. But there were little moments here and there that would make sense. When we talked about the return of Wraith, we had talked about how you know this this one particular police officer was basically breaking into the evidence room and stealing gadgets and equipment that belonged to villains. Well, that's the same room that Carly Cooper and Peter Parker go to. And what Peter Parker does is he says, hey, look, here are a lot of the things that you can use. Because remember, the webbing that Carly Cooper is using is organic webbing. But what she needs is she needs fluids and she needs starchier foods. But she doesn't know this. Peter Parker is just like, hey, here's everything you need in order to get your webbing back. But until that webbing begins to, to get back to its full supply, here's some artificial you know, web shooters that will serve the purpose. Not only that, we end up picking up with Project Rebirth in the Catskill Mountains. Now, for those of you guys who are following Comic Storian's channel, this is the whole Agent Venom aspect of Spider Island. I imagine Benny probably covered that in his videos. I'm not sure. I haven't had a chance to uh, to watch him yet. I never watch comic story in his videos, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it creates kind of a funny uh, a funny thing because again, this shows how large everything goes in the sense that Spider King, you know, this giant spider monster that had popped up earlier in the story was basically sent on a mission to uh, to Project Rebirth. Now, of course, running into Agent Venom, what it does is it bolsters things out a little bit. It basically increases this entire landscape because this adds to the, to the possibility of this infection spreading beyond the borders of New York. And so that's what happens. Mayor J. Jonah Jameson begins to realize that things are becoming more dangerous, that if this infection escapes the island, that these millions of people in Manhattan who all have spider powers will turn into hundreds of millions of people across the United States and eventually billions across the globe if they do not keep it contained. And so in conjunction, you know, with these mandroid suits, basically these uh, these mech suits that are used by the NYPD, along with uh, a handful of the Avengers, Luke Cage, and so on, they basically begin the process of blocking off access to New York. They literally start shutting it all down. They start shutting down bridges, shutting down tunnels, the whole nine yards. They quite literally quarantine the entirety of New York. Hence the reason why it's called Spider Island, because everybody on the island of Manhattan has spider powers. And so at this point, it's the question of how do they bring this down? How do they bring this to an end? Well, of course, the first step is to basically synthesize a cure, which of course, Reed Richards and Max Modell are successfully able to do. The issue is who do they give it to? And so what they had to do is they had to develop a device. And the reason why is because there's only a limited amount of the vaccine. Considering the fact that it had to be made quick, fast, and in a hurry, they need a limited quantity so they can test it. If it works, they can mass produce it. What they end up doing is they end up intending to, to basically analyze different individuals to test them for this strain to see whether or not they have this Spider Island virus. And it turns out that J. Jonah Jameson has it. J. Jonah Jameson basically becomes Spider-Man. And so what we get are all these different situations that kind of roll on top of one another in the sense that we end up having Anti-Venom who's going through, just running through Manhattan, curing everybody of this Spider Island virus that he comes across. But we also have the Avengers, the Mighty Avengers, all these individuals putting these sonic pulses around the city of New York that would operate as these kind of psychic fences, so to speak, so that individuals can't leave. They, they basically can't walk out. It'll end up messing with them, it'll operate as offensive sorts, and they'll basically end up kind of staying corralled in New York proper. And so what we end up doing is we join with uh, with Spider-Man, and we join with Carly Cooper when they arrive at a bank robbery. And that's kind of the cool thing here. That's one of the reasons why I like this, is because it's kind of Dan Slott showing us all these different things that all happen at the same time, right? I mean, you have like the Avengers, you have the Mighty Avengers, you have new Avengers, a whole nine yards, all these different superhero teams, you know, trying to corral this massive infection. You've got Reed Richards, you got Max Modell, the Future Foundation, all working on a cure. And then you've got Spider-Man doing what he's always done, trying to keep things at bay. And stories like major crossover events with, that involve Spider-Man usually always work this way. Unless we're talking about an event that takes, you know, that goes off into space or something like that, or threatens the entirety of the earth at one time, which is to say, like a villain shows up and it's just a threat to the world instead of starting out small, like the city of Manhattan and working their way out. Spider-Man usually always plays a smaller role. During the Onslaught saga, 
for example. Spider-Man wasn't really facing off against Onslaught per se. Spider-Man was facing off against a lot of the Sentinels that Onslaught was using to keep Manhattan in a, in a state of prison. He was fighting off against various villains that were using the chaos as a chance to implement a whole bunch of their own schemes and crimes. And so it was really cool to see a lot of these things take place yet again in the realm of Spider-Man, which is one of the reasons why a lot of fans love him, because Spider-Man is basically Marvel's way of reminding us that the small guy still has issues of their own, and Spider-Man is still looking out for the small guy. This little bit becomes particularly important when we deal with the arrival of the Shocker. And the reason why is because the Shocker as he, as he exists here basically has six arms. And our question is, what in the hell happened? <laughs> <laughs> Why does the Shocker have six arms? Well, this is when we start getting into the idea of a second phase of this inve uh, this infection in the sense that individuals who are exposed to the first phase develop Spider-Man powers. When it gets to the second phase, they start physically mutating. And that's what happened with Shocker. When he was infected, his body began to physically mutate. It gave him six arms. It began to mutate him into an actual spider. Now, what Dan Slott's doing here is he's drawing on the Spider-Man element of Infinity War. For those of you guys who don't know, during the Infinity War story arc, when uh, Adam Warlock Locke's evil persona, Magus, was trying to attain the Infinity Gauntlet by grabbing all the different cosmic cubes from different universes, what Magus ended up doing was creating doppelgangers for the Earth's heroes in order to keep them out of the way. And so where you had like a Wolverine doppelganger, you had a Reed Richards doppelganger, a Hulk doppelganger, so on and so forth, Spider-Man had his doppelganger, which had six arms. The issue is that that doppelganger became so popular that Marvel kind of had to roll him over into after, you know, after the events of Infinity War were done, because people loved that idea. The issue is that nobody could ride him very well. So eventually, they got rid of him. But <laughs> what we end up doing is we basically start picking up with all these different mutations. And this is when we learn who this individual is. This is when we learn who this unknown woman is, that she's basically someone called the Queen. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the Queen is a woman named Adriana Soria, I think it is. And she first appeared in Spectacular Spider-Man Volume 2, number 15, I think. She was a character that was created for the purpose of kind of stepping into this new era of Peter Parker, where Marvel was trying to kind of switch things around, move things around, make them a little more interesting. It was that whole hodgepodge of events leading into one more day. Uh, but it was this idea that she was basically someone who had the ability or had telepathy and basically had what was called the insect gene. And what that meant was that she was able to tap into and control individuals and insects. But the only individuals she could control were people who had insect genes. The problem with this was that her being able to control them was contingent on her knowing that they were they were people with insect genes. And so the reason behind this whole thing, this entire Spire, Spider Island event, was for her to basically engineer her own kingdom. Now, this not the first time she's tried this. During that whole weird era of Spider-Man, there was a point where Peter Parker actually turned into a giant spider. It was weird as hell. But the whole notion was that she had tried to kind of create a high for herself in the sense that she had tried to take over New York. Ultimately, she was defeated. But in the instance where Peter Parker had turned into a giant spider and then eventually was, was transformed back, she had taken a, a husk, a little form, a little piece of this, uh, this gene for Peter. She had taken it to Miles Warren, to the Jackal, and that's what Jackal used to synthesize, or I guess to create this uh, virus planted in these bed bugs and turn the citizens of New York into individuals with the powers of Spider-Man. And so what this would allow the queen to do is then turn around and control those individuals because now they all have an insect gene. And so because of this, what her intention is, is to literally just kind of create her own army. And that's exactly what's happening with these secondary mutations. All these people who are beginning to, to mutate are turning into giant spiders. That's literally what they are. They're just turning into massive spiders. But this is going to allow uh, the queen to basically begin the process of engineering her her own kingdom to basically create her own uh, her own place of rule. Now, the other cool thing about this is that we actually end up joining Anti Venom, and this is kind of the funny situation here because there's a mishmash of things at work here. There's a mishmash of plays going on all at the same time in the sense that with Spider King having been uh, having you know gone against Agent Venom, that when Spider King returns to the Queen as well as uh, Miles Warren, this is not actually Spider King. Instead, this is Agent Venom posing as Spider King, and that's why this is one of those cool things is because it's the ability of Agent Venom to use the, uh, the Venom symbiote to kind of shapeshift, to adjust himself. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people love Agent Venom because it was taking the Venom symbiote and using it in a way that hadn't really been used before. But in addition to all of this, these individuals who are beginning to physically manifest, who are beginning to physically mutate, actually end up going to Our Lady of Saints Church and grabbing anti-venom. And the reason why is because word has reached their ears that anti-venom has the ability to cure people of their infection. Now, this is why we did the whole thing of like, you know, of anti-venom and the Punisher team up, the Amazing Spider-Man and the and anti-venom team up, the or 
origin of Anti-Venom because this was Dan Slott bringing this redemption of Eddie Brock into full view, basically bringing it all the way back around again. It was Dan Slott saying, hey, look, this is how, why Eddie Brock is basically a good guy. It's him trying to do the right thing because he looks at all these individuals and he says, you poor cast off souls, come to Papa Anti-Venom. I have the cure to what ails you. And uh, it's basically him curing people. It's him saying, look, I'm a good guy. I'm curing every last one of these individuals. I'm literally saving New York. Now that'll become a lot more important than it seems right now, but it's a really, really interesting set of events because for Peter Parker, for Spider-Man himself, it's absolute pandemonium and it's chaos because among all these giant spiders are Carly Cooper. Now, while he's trying to track her down, while he's trying to stop these giant spiders that are attacking individuals, one of them basically begins to lay waste to the vehicle or to the uh, to the motorcade of J. Jonah Jameson. And this is kind of cool because what happens is Jameson refuses to be saved by Peter Parker yet again. Keep in mind, Jameson is always housed a hatred for Peter Parker, but in Jameson's mind, the death of his wife, Marla, is tied into Peter Parker's actions. And of course, Marla told him in her final moments, do not succumb to hate. Do not blame Spider-Man. Do not blame Alistair Smythe, Spider Slater. Do not blame any of those. Just accept the fact that sometimes things like this happen and there's nothing we can really do to stop it. And so what ends up happening here is that in the midst of all this, J. Jonah Jameson reveals the fact that he has spider powers. He grabs Peter Parker and he says, we're going back to the emergency command center. We're going to find a way to get over this. I think I have an ace in the hole. Now this is kind of cool because this is an uneasy alliance between J. Jonah Jameson and Spider-Man. If it was Jameson's way, he just throw Spider-Man in jail and call it a day. But he needs Spider-Man. He needs Spider-Man here because he's basically the only individual present in New York that has spider powers that can use them effectively. Everybody else that has spider powers are turning into giant spider monsters. And so what we do is we pick up with J. Jonah Jameson basically interrogating Alistair Smith. And Smith is a little cryptic here because first of all, he says, look, man, like the whole reason why I'm Spider Slayer is because you and your stupid tabloid led to the death of my father. They led to the destruction of my career. They led to me becoming a bad guy. All I want is revenge on you. But then it's also Alistair Smith saying, hey, I got my revenge because this is when he realizes the only reason J. Jonah Jameson would come to him after Smith killed Jameson's wife is because Jameson himself is infected. And so it's like Alistair Smith getting the revenge that he always wanted. Now, this comes to bear, this little bit of hubris on Smith's behalf comes to bear when the queen begins to use her telepathy and start talking to J. Jonah Jameson, begins to infiltrate his mind. And she basically appears as the wife of J. Jonah Jameson and says, remember how I told you not to blame yourself, how I told you not to blame Spider-Man, don't blame Alistair Smith, I lied kill them all. And so it's so cool because then J. Jonah Jameson starts to lose his mind. Now, again, we get a little bit more of this kind of a montage, this little bit of a hodgepodge where we have Black Cat and we have a few of the ground level heroes really trying to protect some of these sonic devices for the purpose of keeping everybody corralled in New York. We have uh, Agent Venom going against Anti-Venom, which is actually pretty amazing. Like it's, it's pretty badass. We also end up having uh, Mary Jane Watson develop spider powers on her own. And so because of this, we ultimately pick up with Agent Venom having defeated, defeated Anti-Venom. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we don't see it, but it may end up being that that's part of the Venom tie-in. I'll have to double check on that, but Anti-Venom is essentially defeated here. Now, the irony of all this is that Agent Venom didn't ask any questions. He just showed up and started attacking Anti-Venom, and it was just like, you're coming with me. And it's kind of funny, because when Anti-Venom, when Eddie Brock is talking to, to Reed Richards, you know, he's like, hey, look, I would have come willingly. All you had to do was tell me what it is that you wanted. If what you wanted was to basically use me as a way to synthesize a cure, then I would have been fine with that. And Reed Richards says, well, I'm glad you're on board, man, because we're literally taking the entire Anti-Venom symbiote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Eddie Brock's response is like, what? And he's like, yeah, man, you're not going to be able to be anti-venom anymore. Now, keep in mind, this is Dan Slott kind of wrapping this up. This is Dan Slott saying, hey, guys, look, for the time being, at least as far as I'm aware, for the time being, this is the beginning and the end of anti-venom. It's kind of wrapping these things up, sort of bringing things to a close. Because remember, the entire anti-venom arc was designed for the sole purpose of redeeming Eddie Brock in the eyes of comic book fans, in the eyes of uh, of really, you know, the, the, the superhero landscape within Marvel Comics itself. Now, of course, with J. Jonah Jameson, you know, mutating freaking out under the influence of the queen, he immediately attacks Alistair Smythe. And in his last couple seconds, you know, with the, the last few seconds of life that he has left, Alistair Smythe says, you have everything you need to defeat these giant spiders. You already have your army. All you have to do is figure out a way to tap into it and use it for your own ends. All right, so picking up with Spider Island Part 2. I know a lot of people are just probably gonna be like, no, cliffhangers. So well, the good thing is that this video came out within hours of the last video. So don't be giving me no hard times about cliffhangers. Don't be giving me a hard time about no cliffhangers. So what we end up doing, <laughs> what we end up doing here is we basically pick up, uh, kind of continuing where we left off. We join Mary Jane Watson facing off against some of these guys, but also using her, uh, using her own webbing, her own spider abilities. But the cool thing about this is that, you know, within Our Lady of Saints Church, where 
these individuals were hanging out again they were just kind of left there when uh agent venom was able to succeed in defeating anti-venom uh mary jane watson begins to gain a better understanding of what it means to be spider-man and that's one of the interesting things about this is because this never really seemed to be a concept that was explored just because of the fact that i'm not aware of mary jane watson ever having uh spider powers on this level instead before the events of one more day and even after the events of one more day where she still knew the identity of peter parker the only real exposure she had to what it meant to be spider-man was basically the toll that it would take on peter parker having to walk the knife's edge of keeping his identity secret while simultaneously trying to make sure that he could be an effective hero and so because of this she's coming to it from the other side of the coin she's seeing what it means having to pull her punches you know facing off against a lot of these uh these giant spiders recognizing that they're people at the same time and they could possibly be cured and so as her realizing that she basically has to stop these spiders from killing those humans that haven't uh, that haven't mutated while simultaneously not killing the spiders and so again it's this very interesting situation because she has to kind of be a savior and a and, and not a killer at the same time if that makes any sense but again we also end up joining with the queen and the reason why is because of the fact that reed richards uh is using this cure on son johnny remember so johnny is basically a member of a horizon labs one of the people who was infected but almost immediately after this cure begins to develop after almost immediately after it's derived the queen begins to start going through all these individuals who have this uh this insect gene by way of this spider island virus and eventually is able to tap into sajani once she realizes sajani is in horizon labs and reed richards and his team have synthesized a cure and so using sajani she basically kind of forces the physical mutation and the result is that sajani kind of gets out of control for a second but is almost immediately subdued by a combination of jessica drew spider woman and reed richards himself now with regards to the injection of this cure this is when the queen starts to realize that this cure is legitimate and that if it's mass produced if it's turned into like an aerosol if it goes airborne it'll literally take away everything the queen's been working for all of her power will basically be gone and so what happens is jackal sends kane on a mission to horizon labs for the purpose of basically contaminating this cure making sure that it can never go into full-blown use now at this point what we also do is we basically join the man in the sixth room we only get a glimpse here but we join the man in the sixth room this unknown third individual who was helpful in basically creating a, a cure by way of reed richards and max modell and what we end up finding out is that this third man is michael morbius now michael morbius being rolled into this story is not an accident remember prior to michael morbius you know gaining his infection becoming a living vampire he was a nobel winning biochemist and so he's really like one of the best people that you would want he's really one of the top minds when it comes to biochemistry when it comes to biological contaminants when it comes to creating a cure for virtually anything the other half of this is that michael morbius has always tried to find a way to cure himself and so it creates a really interesting situation because it's it's kind of michael morbius offering some measure of atonement in addition to this michael morbius is just a fan favorite so why not have him in the story hell like it, it just works <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool to see him there. I'm sure a lot of fans are just like, yeah, Michael Morbius, we don't get to see a lot of him, but we get to see enough of him here. Now, of course, the other funny thing is that we also end up joining Madam Webb, Julia Carpenter, who like appears to Reed Richards and is like, you've put these psychic inhibitors around the city of New York, take them down. And then she leaves and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> she she just, she just like shows up she's like fix it now and then just leaves and it's, it's kind of funny it's just like this quick little pop-up situation here but what this does is it allows dan slot to begin segueing into the final act of this story and what i mean here is that where these psychic blocks were put in place for the purpose of basically removing people's ability to to leave the city of new york what ends up happening is that with this uh this psychic inhibitor horizon labs kind of has to play this balancing act where they have to sit down and they have to say okay fine look we cannot take down the psychic inhibitors in their entirety because if we if we we do this infection will spread we have a cure but if they just scatter to the four corners of the world well suddenly we're stretched too thin and then there's no stopping this contagion but if we keep it here in new york then it's easier to control it's easier to cure and so what happens is horizon labs uses some of the knowledge of peter parker that he had given them over the course of his experience and they basically kind of modify the signal to send it out in a way that basically restores peter parker's spider sense now with regards to the restoration of peter parker's spider sense this coincides with his conflict with kane and the reason why is because the jackal had sent kane to horizon labs for the purpose of contaminating this cure and so when peter parker had traveled back to horizon labs he was basically forced to face off against kane now again this is mutated this is kane all kinds of screwed up the full fruition of where his character was going to be because of his unstable genes and so because of this during the conflict when uh peter parker's uh when his when his spider sense is restored to him the result is that he's able to basically outwit and outmaneuver kane in virtually every feasible sense and this is one of the reasons why it works is because kane has you know he's stronger he's faster he's more more durable than spider-man
Spider-Man, but Spider-Man basically is able to use his way of the spider kung fu in conjunction with his spider sense and make himself virtually untouchable. Now, none of this really matters just because of the fact Peter Parker basically sends Kane flying into the vat of anti-venom, you know, um, and, and essentially just kind of cures him and returns him to his normal appearance. But what Dan Slott was doing with this was basically saying this whole nonsense about Kane being like a weird physical spider thing, this has gone far enough. Like we need to, we need to either like, well, pardon my language, we need to poo or we need to get off the pot. Like we got to do something with it. And so Dan Slott's like, we're just going to basically send him off. Like what we're going to do is we're just going to send him off to the cornfields. He's going to be Scarlet Spider. But in order for us to pull that off, what we need to do is cure him. We need to basically make his, make his body physically perfect. So then instead of having these corrupted genes the way he did, you know, as part of, uh, part of Clone Saga, that instead what he's going to do is he's going to have I mean, basically perfected genes is basically what's going to happen here. Now, uh, what we end up doing is we end up finding out that because of the fact that this signal has been modified, that has restored the spider sense of Peter Parker, Dan Slott begins to draw on the web of life and destiny. Because keep in mind, when the web of life and destiny was introduced in Marvel Comics, it was modifying Spider-Man's mythos. Prior to that point, it was always believed that Spider-Man's powers, his strength, agility, speed, you know, spider sense, so on and so forth, all of those just came from just the radiation in his blood. The web of life and destiny said, no, that's not the case. Peter Parker is basically an avatar. He uh, he more or less is a character that reflects kind of a representation of these totems. You know, these the, he's basically, a, I guess, a, a herald of the web and life and def uh, destiny, if that makes any sense. All that really means is that he derives his powers directly from the web of life and destiny. Well, so does the queen and so does Madam Web. And so by giving Peter Parker his spider sense back, the queen now has full access to her abilities and Madam Web has full access to her abilities. What we also find out is that this giant weird spider monster that appeared at the beginning of the story was Steve Rogers. That Steve Rogers had been taken by Jackal, he had been mutated and turned into a servant of the queen. Now, of course, he had since been turned back, but the idea here is that he's basically kind of this last man standing trying to face off against the queen herself and bring her rule down. The issue with this is that with the queen having full access to her powers, she goes into her full form and what she becomes is an Omega level threat. Now, this is something that I want to draw your attention to because in Marvel Comics, when it comes to the idea of like Omega level mutants, Omega level threats, this is how they're confirmed. For example, we saw in like uh, in Uncanny X-Men number 513, I posted about this on Twitter, we saw that Emma Frost was confirmed as an Omega level mutant. In X-Men volume two, issue number 70 or something like that, uh, Charles Xavier was confirmed to be an alpha level mutant. These are how things end up playing out, that there's individuals whose status within the uh, Marvel community is confirmed. Now, when it comes to like Omega level threats, those are basically people that that have the power of Omega level mutants, but they're not mutants. That's all that means. That's, that's the only difference. It's just kind of a, an interchangeable uh, term. But the idea is that we also have Peter Parker trying to maintain this ruse that he and Spider-Man are two distinctly different individuals. Because remember, in the mind of Peter Parker, he hasn't revealed his identity to anybody yet. No one knows who he is. And so to the eyes of everybody, except for like Reed Richards and a handful of others that don't, that, that, that know his secret identity, when they see Kane Parker walking around in the Spider-Man costume while simultaneously seeing him standing alongside Peter Parker, well, then they have no reason to believe that Peter Parker and Spider-Man are one and the same. It's basically Peter's ruse. This is, is his way of kind of clearing the air when everybody with Horizon Labs is there and it's him saying, hey, look, guys, see, like me and Spider-Man are two distinctly different people. And so because of this, we basically pick up with kind of like this last man battle. I mean, you have really, you know, you have like Kane Parker, you have uh, you have Peter Parker, you have all these guys that are facing off against, uh, you know, against the Queen Spider. But what ends up happening is Peter Parker begins to draw on uh, what it was that Elsir Smythe said. You have all the resources that you need in order to take down all these different spiders and the queen. All you have to do is harness them effectively. And that's when Peter recalls back to the Octobots of Dr. Octopus. The Dr. Octopus would use a helmet to control all these little individual bots. Peter Parker races back to the precinct alongside Mary Jane Watson, puts the helmet on and begins using all these different Octobots for the purpose of trying to take out the queen and all these other individuals who are infected with this virus. The problem with this is this queen is wildly powerful in terms of her abilities. And so what ends up happening here is we basically end up seeing Kane doing what needs to be done, where Peter Parker has this moral code. And Peter Parker says, we do not kill. We need to incapacitate her. We need to take her out and then take her prisoner. Kane says, no. The only way that we can deal with this is to take this woman out, is to eliminate her in her entirety. And that's what Dan Slott's drawing on here with the idea of Kane. Because remember, going all the way back to Clone Saga when he first showed up, Kane was designed to be this character who was amoral. He wasn't really a good guy. He wasn't really a bad guy. He had his own moral compass. He would kill if he needed to. He would save people if he needed to. He was willing to go further than Peter Parker was. And so what happens as the story basically comes to a close is that Kane wipes out the Spider Queen, basically eliminates her in her entirety. And so with the entire Spider uh, Spider Island event kind of winding down, the cure is basically synthesized, it's mass distributed to everybody to the point that everybody kind of begins to wind down from their infection. And so what this does is this 
this leads into the epilogue of Spider Island, which begins to wrap up all these loose ends. It's Dan Slott going through and saying, okay, here's where we stand with the Spider-Man mythos going forward after the events of Spider Island. Okay, so picking up with the epilogue to Spider Island, this is actually really kind of cool. The whole basis, from what I could tell anyway, the whole basis behind Spider Island was really kind of like what the early bit of Dan Slott's run was leading up to, in the sense that it was this idea that Dan Slott looked around and said, there's a lot of things in the Spider-Man mythos that I don't really care for that was done by a committee. Because remember, when Dan Slott first became part of this writing committee after the events of One More Day, it was everybody's going to be part and parcel to this. You know, there's going to be, there's a lot of uh, fingers in this story that's being told. It wasn't just Dan Slott doing what Dan Slott wanted to do, but having the ability to take over the title on his own and do whatever it is that he wanted to do granted him the opportunity to say okay let's just clear out all the stuff that i don't like let's get rid of all the things i don't want to that i don't want to have in the spider-man mythos let's rectify all this stuff and that's exactly what happens here but it also sends out some threads for future stories that will come later on down the line specifically superior spider-man so what we do is we basically just kind of pick up with the aftermath i mean the story is called naked city and it's, it's kind of funny here i mean there's all these different superheroes in the uh, in the marvel universe who were all giant spiders you know during the events of spider island and it's kind of funny here you know, because it's like everybody's kind of recovering and everybody's shocked that they were naked. The only person who doesn't care is Hercules. And Hercules is like, yes, look upon my besiege with envious eyes, male superheroes. It's it's <laughs> it's really kind of this, this funny situation. That's one of the things that I love so much about his character because he's just kind of like, I'm in my natural form. Like, I am Hercules. You know, I am the god of strength. They don't call me a giant for no reason. And it's... uh. <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, it's just one of these funny little, one of these funny little things. Again, it's just kind of, it's, it's really just clean up. You know, it's just, it's cleaning things up, getting things sorted out, getting things back in order. And so the idea here is that we pick up with Mary Jane Watson and Peter Parker. And this is one of the things that's kind of cool because Dan Slott sort of takes this moment between the two of them. And it's not really Dan Slott saying, hey, we're going to get them back together again. It's Dan Slott saying, hey, these two share a connection that no one else really shares. And that's true. You know, even within the, the Spider-Man mythos, that's true. You know, the fact that they dated for so long. She was one of the first people to know about his secret identity, so on and so forth. But outside of the comic, we as the reader look at that and it's like, even if they're only really good friends, for us as the reader, for people who followed Spider-Man, there's a connection between the two of them that no one else has. The, the stories that have been written about Mary Jane Watson, about Peter Parker have had their ups and downs. They've been married. They broke up. Their marriage was nullified by Mephisto. There's all kinds of things that go on with their story. And so a lot of people look at that and say, look at the legacy that was forged between these two. And it's really Dan Slott kind of pointing at that. It's Dan Slott saying, hey, they're showing a roof top moment and it represents everything that they've been through up to this point the other half of this is that in the middle of the conversation peter parker just basically has to bail out because you know aunt may's grabbing his attention when she and J. jonah jameson senior are finally making their way off to boston officially leaving new york after the events of spider island and this is when we learn that mary jane watson retained her spider powers and so it's really kind of cool you know to, to ask the question what kind of stories are we going to see but again this whole idea of anti-venom you know for example the idea that eddie brock was looking for atonement for his past acts when he was a villain comes to fruition when reed richard pops up on TV. Now, again, keep in mind, when it comes to the Marvel landscape, Reed Richards, how he's viewed within Marvel Comics is how, he, is how he's viewed outside of Marvel Comics. Within the Marvel Comics universe, it's like Reed Richards, one of the smartest men in the world. Everybody respects him. He's an explorer. The superheroes love him. When it comes to uh, us as readers outside of comics, it's like the Fantastic Four, the first family of Marvel. The Fantastic Four set the groundwork for the Avengers. Force works all these different teams that would come later on down the line. You know, Guardians of the Galaxy, they were the template behind that, the legacy characters. And so when Reed Richards shows up on TV and says New York was saved because of the actions of Eddie Brock, well, then Eddie Brock's a good guy now. And there's no arguing that point. It's just the way it is. And it's, it's really cool because that's the kind of the kind of respect that Reed Richards commands from people in New York, from the superhero community, so on and so forth. But again, it's just kind of wrapping up a few loose ends here, you know, in the sense that uh, J. Jonah Jameson's having a drink with Robbie Robertson. Again, they're kind of on uh, kind of on different terms here in terms of, you know, J. Jonah Jameson being mayor of New York, Robbie Robertson running frontline now. But it's also this idea that that J. Jonah Jameson still doesn't seem to want to give up the notion that Peter Parker, that, that Spider-Man saved the city. He kind of wants to hang on to his anger, hang on to his hatred for all this. And at the end of the day, Robbie Robertson says, dude, you've got to give Spider-Man a break. You know, he was basically the key to saving the city. He's one of the people that helped save the entirety of the city. And so in the end, you know, J. Jonah Jameson's like, fine, I'll give him a break. You know, I will, I'll cut him a break. I'll, I'll make a call and we'll see what happens. You know, we have Peter Parker helping some guys on the bridge, um, you know, get things cleared up, you know, get things cleared out. It's just kind of this, this cool 
cool little moment. The problem is that after Peter's done saying his goodbyes to Aunt May, after she and J. Jonah Jameson leave for Boston, he gets back home to the apartment with Carly Cooper. And this is really where Dan Slott begins to sort of wrap things up between the two because Carly Cooper's breaking up with him. Now, this is when I said it was important that we had to keep in mind the whole idea of Peter Parker going on TV and saying, I'm Spider-Man, you know, during the events of Spider Island because Carly Cooper has figured out his secret identity and that was not supposed to happen. Remember, it's almost like those, you know, it's almost like the Harry Potter universe, right? You know, when those wizards of stuff cast those spells, somebody walks up to something they're not supposed to walk up to and then suddenly they remember they're supposed to go do something else. The spell is much like that, that Doctor Strange uh, cast in the sense that unless Peter Parker went to Carly Cooper and said, you know, took off his mask and said, hey, look, I'm Spider-Man or revealed his identity to who it was, uh, to, to her individually, or she just walked up on him while he was changing into his Spider-Man costume, she's not supposed to know. No one is supposed to know, but she knows. And what she says is, I'm a forensic scientist. My job is to put the pieces together. And what she says is, when Spider Island happened and I was gaining my spider powers for the first time and everybody in the city was gaining their spider powers for the first time, you were the only one that knew exactly how to use them. You were the only one that slid right into the role and knew it perfect. And she even goes back, if you guys remember, with volume one in big time, she goes back and says, when we were hanging out and I was showing you how to roller skate and you didn't know how to roller skate and you were trying to figure it out, she was like, that's what you should have done when you were tricking me. And that's that's the biggest issue for her is not that Peter Parker's Spider-Man. It's the fact that he lied to her. With Carly Cooper, her family's mired in, in deceit. Her family's mired in people keeping their own secrets. With her going to Peter Parker, when they first started getting together, her, her, her whole thing was, you better know what you're doing and you better not lie. And Peter Parker lied to her, duped her about his identity. Now, granted, this was done by Peter for the safety of all. I mean, that was something that was established during the events of Civil War. That was the whole crux. When Peter Parker went on stage during the events of Civil War and said, hey, everybody, my name is Peter Parker. I'm revealing my identity because I trust Iron Man when he says superheroes who come forward and register with S.H.I.E.L.D. will not have to worry about their families being put in danger. That was exactly what happened. As soon as Peter Parker revealed his identity, he walked out. People tried to attack him. They tried to attack Aunt May. They tried to attack Mary Jane Watson. And so in response to this, when Civil War was over, when it was all said and done, after the events of One More Day and all that kind of good stuff, when Peter Parker went to Doctor Strange, you know, in the post-Civil War landscape and said, I want to make sure no one knows what my identity is, Doctor Strange cast a spell and it was done to make sure that if Peter Parker, for some reason, his identity was dumped out, that he wouldn't have to worry about that. He wouldn't have to worry about people figuring out who he is. He wouldn't have to worry about his friends and family being put in danger. The issue with all this is that for Carly Cooper, it just doesn't, it doesn't resonate. She just doesn't grasp it. At the end of the day, she's just like, you lied to me. And so ultimately she says, we're done we're over with. Now, what follows this is actually kind of weak, to be honest. It's actually kind of a weak way to do this. What Doctor Strange, you know, when, when Peter Parker goes to Doctor Strange and says, why did she know my secret identity? No one was supposed to know what in the heck happened. Doctor Strange says, when you went on TV and told people I'm Peter Parker, I have spider powers, you basically told everybody you were Spider-Man. You undid the spell, or at least didn't really undo it, but make it weaker, make it possible for people to know who he was. It's not like he was wearing a Spider-Man mask and went on TV like he did during Civil War, take his mask off and say, I'm Spider-Man, but it was almost the same thing. And because that it weakened the spell to a degree and people can start figuring out his identity. Now, this was basically Dan Slott coming back and saying, okay, let's get things sorted out. Let's make things reasonable. Let's set this for the purpose of making Spider-Man stories a little more dangerous because that was always kind of an intrinsic value of Peter Parker's stories. Someone somewhere may figure out his identity and if they do, what happens? Like that was always kind of the basis behind it. So it was basically beefing up the number of people in his rogues gallery who could know who he is, taking it beyond Jackal, you know, getting into all these different individuals and setting the stage for Superior Spider-Man. And so what we end up doing is we sort of transition to this last little bit of a send-off with Madam Web. Again, you know, Julia Carpenter, Madam Web being able to see the future and so on. Uh, she really just kind of sits down with, with Peter and she says, look, you know, what you are given here is a, is a chance to basically start over. You know, you were given or you, you had this last little vial of the cure from Max Modell. If you take this, it will cure you of your spider powers. You will no longer be Spider-Man. You will be Peter Parker and you will be able to live a regular life. She says, the web of life and destiny chooses as avatars for the totems. You're Spider-Man because the web of life and destiny chose you to be Spider-Man. If you walk away, someone else can take your place. It could be Ben Riley. It could be Kane Parker. It could be any number of people. It could be a random guy off the street. It's her basically saying you have an out. You have a chance to walk away. This is Dan Slott toying with the notion that Peter Parker might not be Spider-Man anymore. But in the end, he says no. 
He says, I'm going to stay Spider-Man. I'm going to be Spider-Man. Of course, we would have a hard time envisioning a scenario where Peter Parker was never Spider-Man again. I have a hard time imagining a situation where Marvel would release a story where Peter Parker, you know, in the main Marvel universe, where it's like Peter Parker is never going to be Spider-Man again. Like, he's just going to be somebody else. Like, they, they kill off Peter Parker and replace him with Miles Morales. That'll never happen. It's like eliminating Superman and having him gone forever and never bringing him back. In the end, Peter Parker's a legacy character. He's, he's so significant to the success of Marvel Comics and one of their best-selling titles, if that happened, they'd be on the verge of destroying their entire comic book line just because of one individual person. It's a bold statement, but it's a statement that I think is actually pretty accurate here. And so in the end, we pick up with Mary Jane Watson. And, uh, and this is kind of the cool thing is because Peter's also learning that Mary Jane still has her powers to a degree, but it's also kind of reconciling these two things. And even then, you know, he sits down and he talks with Mary Jane about how Peter, you know, how he and Carly have basically broken up. Now, again, Dan Slott's kind of toying here. He's like, well, maybe will they get together? Won't they get together? And we're really not given an answer here. We're really not given an answer on whether or not the two of them will end up getting back together again. Instead, the conversation kind of deviates towards the idea that Peter Parker feels like, well, his actions will just go unnoticed. That'll just be another instance of Peter saving the city, and no one will really care that much. But Mary Jane Watson says, no, the Empire State Building has been lit up in celebration of you, your colors. It's the city of New York saying thank you. It's the city of New York basically saying thank you, Spider-Man, for saving our city, for keeping us alive. And it's, and it's cool. It's, it's a really great way because what this does is basically wrap up like the first half of Dan Slott's run. The first part of Dan Slott's run. It's him clearing all that stuff out and saying, okay, guys, now we basically get to start over again. Now we officially get into to what it is that I wanted to do. Now we officially get into everything leading up into Superior Spider-Man, going into Spider-Verse, going into all new, all different, Amazing Spider-Man, all that kind of good stuff. Okay, so... <sighs> I'll be honest with you guys, when Dying Wish first came out, I have never, with the exception of One More Day, in terms of like modern Spider-Man history, I've never even heard of a more divisive story than this. People, there were people out there who hated Superior Spider-Man. They were just like, no, no, Peter Parker stays Spider-Man. And that's just what, it's always Peter Parker. It's, 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 it needs to be Peter Parker. Like they were getting so bent out of shape. But there were other people like me who thought it was amazing. And it was just like, dude, this is this is awesome. So we're gonna run over this. We will let you guys decide. Now, in terms of like how, how people title, like a lot of people say this is the actual prelude to Superior Spider-Man. I consider it part of Superior Spider-Man. I mean, I consider it to be, you know, a part of the main thing. Cause I think it makes it more cohesive. I think it makes it more of like a cohesive thing. Plus, if you go and buy Superior Spider-Man, you usually kind of get, you know, dying, uh, dying wish thrown in. But I really enjoyed this story because what this does is it initially just kind of picks up with, with Spider-Man Peter Parker, right? And there were a few stories that took place in between Spider Island and this. But to me, those stories weren't particularly interesting. There were just moments in those stories that were significant. But I found it very difficult to, to bring myself to run over the entirety of like ends of the earth just for like one moment. So it was it was kind of a, a weird situation. But of course, you know, this this is cool because it almost seems like a back a back to basics for Spider-Man, right? He's just going around, he's doing a Spider-Man thing, he's saving people. You know, he kind of realizes that he's got a scar on his face from an attack that he had when he was going against the goblins, you know, so on and so forth. But he's kind of going through his messages. This is this is where things get a little weird because something seems a bit off, right? Like he's getting a few messages. You know, he gets messages from Mary Jane Watson. You know, Mary Jane's like, hey, look, are you coming to the club tonight? He gets messages from uh from Max Modell saying, Hey, your your review that's coming up, you know, for, for Horizon Labs, and you know, he's got Tyler that he has to spend with uh, with Aunt May and, and so on and so forth. So his life is really packed to the brim. And of course, it's kind of cool because he's going through, he's, you know, remaking his uh, his his spider webbing fluid and so on and so forth. But things start to get a little funny when he encounters Mary Jane at her club. And what he does is he really kind of approaches her and he says like, hey, look, we've been dancing around this long enough. It's time that we get back together. Now, this was crazy because it was, it was Dan Slott kind of toying with the idea that Mary Jane Watson and Peter Parker we're gonna get back together again. And, and fan, this is like one of the things that, that like a, like the diehard fans wanted so much more. They really, really, really wanted Mary Jane Watson and they wanted Peter Parker to get back together again. They really wanted them to be reunited. But in a lot of ways, it was just kind of like, Marvel had basically said that's never going to happen. And so the idea was, well, maybe Dan Slott will allow it to happen. Maybe Dan Slott will be the reason why it does happen. Of course, it doesn't really seem to be the case. Instead, you know, it's just kind of like, hey, look, we gotta go hang out with your Aunt May, yada, yada, yada. But of course, you know, spending time with Aunt May is also interrupted by the fact that he's getting a request to basically see Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus is calling him by name, Peter Parker. And so, of course, he ends up meeting with the new Avengers, you know, Captain America and, and Wolverine and so on, and then shows up there. Now, this is where things get crazy because when I was going through this, it was just like, wow. I, mean, I, remember, I remember originally reading this and it's like, what in the world's going on? But it 
also seemed like Dan Slott was paying an appropriate tribute, right? I mean, Dr. Octopus is basically dying. That's been the gist of his character really ever since the events of Spider-Man Big Time. He's just been in the background and he's been dying. He's been orchestrating plans here and there, but the plans really seem to be just his attempt to kind of, you know, to, to implement one final successful campaign before he passed on. And this moment seemed to be kind of Dan Slott sitting down and saying, okay, look, Dr. Octopus is dying. He's really Spider-Man's most formidable foe with the exception of maybe Venom or, or Carnage. But in terms of long-standing villains, you know, he's one of Spider-Man's oldest and most dangerous foes. It's really just the right thing to do. It's really just the right thing to do a send-off, you know, to, to have Dr. Octopus and Spider-Man do a, a send-off to one another. But what ends up happening is we find out that this is not Dr. Octopus, this is Peter Parker. Their minds have been swapped and Peter Parker or really Spider-Man's just like, yeah, I have all your memories all your experiences. Everything that makes you who you are is now me. I look like you. Everyone believes you're me. You are Dr. Octopus. Let me tell you something, Rob Core. When this reveal came out, it was like, what? Like, holy cow. <laughs> It was mind blowing because, you know, like Dr. Octopus starts dying because he's only got a few hours left, you know, and he starts, he basically, you know, begins the process of, of dying, you know, they're trying to keep him alive as best they can. But Peter Parker, you know, Spider-Man just kind of leaves and he's like, well, that's that. And he just basically just kind of takes off. And so what, what we do is we basically pick up with the second half of, of Dying Wish. And really, I guess the first half is kind of a prelude, but we basically pick up with, you know, Dying Wish proper. And what Dying Wish does is it answers the questions. How in the world did this happen? How did Dr. Octopus manage to swap minds with Peter Parker? Because remember, this just came out of left field. It was just suddenly Peter Parker's mind is in the body of Dr. Octopus and the mind of Dr. Octopus is in the body of Peter Parker. And so it was like, what in the heck happened that, that went through all this? Well, of course, initially it picks up with Peter Parker worrying about what things may happen, what Dr. Octopus might do. What's ironic about this is that Dr. Octopus doesn't do any of those things. In fact, I would say that Dr. Octopus is Spider-Man. It's probably better than Peter Parker. I like Dr. Octopus as, as Spider-Man better than I liked Peter Parker as Spider-Man. It was interesting. Had it gone on long enough, the novelty would have worn off. But for what a superior Spider-Man was, I think he was better than, than Peter Parker. But of course, his main concern is that Dr. Octopus is basically going to, to swindle his friends and family. You know, that he's going to force himself onto Mary Jane Watson, that he's going to steal the fortune or steal the money of, uh, of J. Jonah Jameson uh, Sr. and Aunt May. He's going to kill a lot of his superhero friends because he has access to the Avengers Mansion and they don't know that. They don't know that this is Dr. Octopus. He goes through and starts experiencing the memories of Dr. Octopus, Doc Ock's abusive father. The first time that Dr. Octopus became Dr. Octopus. The time that Doc Ock and Aunt May got together, uh, physically, physically together. <laughs> <laughs> but then he also began, this is when we're going to go into the whole idea of how it is that Dr. Octopus is able to pull off the mind swap. And what ended up happening is, of course, Dr. Octopus had a helmet of sorts that was used to basically control these little nanobots that he had that went all the way back to Spider-Man big time. And of course, Peter Parker had taken this, this device to control these nanobots to, you know, basically bring Dr. Octopus's various campaigns to an end. But he had also taken the technology of the device and incorporated it in his own spider armor outfit. And what this did is it gave Dr. Octopus a direct look line into the mind of Peter Parker. He literally opened the door for Doc Ock. And that's what's so cool about this story. It shows how smart Dr. Octopus is. He was planning ahead. All these campaigns that he had, once he realized he was dying, was for the sole purpose of basically finding a way to enter, to map Peter Parker's mind. And that's exactly what he did. He just started going through and mapping Peter Parker's mind. And when the opportunity came, he basically swapped their bodies and nobody knew what was going on. It took place, you know, off panel. Nobody had any idea that that happened. And so the, the, the whole whole point though the whole concept here is that Peter Parker is now panicking because he has to find a way to get back into his normal body well of course this also coincides with Kurt Connors and the cool thing about this is Dan Slott's kind of pulling out all the stops like he's really just kind of yanking all these things out for example he says that where previously the lizard was believed to have just been this mindless beast you know this this Hulk to Doc Connors Bruce Banner that in truth Doc Connors mind is alive and well in the body of of the lizard the lizard is as scientifically intelligent as, as Doc Connors was you know it's it's not a mindless beast it's an intelligent being inside an incredible body. Doc Connors just can't go back to the way he was before. But this is cool because this is basically, you know, Connors spilling the beans on who he is and what he's about. And it changes everything for Peter Parker because in his mind, he's like, you should go tell someone. Dr. Con you know, Doc Connors is not the bad guy. The lizard is the bad guy. Tell someone what's going on. But of course, then the question has to be asked, like, who's going to believe him? 
Like, who would believe him if he told them that? You know, oh, it's really me, Doc Connors, inside the body of, of the lizard. Who's going to believe him that? If You know, who's going to believe that? I mean, I guess maybe psychics could figure that out. But in truth, it just creates a situation that Doc Connors really can't seem to get out of. And so what ends up happening is Peter Parker begins to sort of put two and two together. Going through the memories of, of Dr. Octopus, of, of Otto Octavius, going through his mind, reading his memories, you know, learning what he's about, he begins to realize that Doc Ock always had a contingency plan for every situation. If he were ever captured, whatever the case may be, he always had a contingency plan. In this instance, he had a contingency plan to reform the Sinister Six and break himself out of the Raft. Now remember, the Raft is a prison that exists really, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. It's no man's land. People who were taken there are isolated from virtually everyone. They're, it's designed explicitly for the purpose of keeping villains in isolation. But what he does is he basically initiates a protocol that was owned by Dr. Octopus that sets in motion the reactivation of the Sinister Six. And this is when we get Hydro Man. This is when we get, you know, the Scorpion. And when we get all these different guys coming together for the purpose of getting Dr. Octopus out of there of course again in their mind they don't know it's peter parker they believe that it's dr octopus and that's why this works so well because it's the street crosses both sides you know with this scenario it's where you know dr octopus can parade around in the mind in the body of peter parker and people believe that dr octopus is peter parker peter parker can parade around in the body of dr octopus such as it is and lead people to believe that he's actually dr octopus so as we get into Superior Spider-Man, again, we're kind of doing this little bit of a prelude here, but really with Suicide Run, it's really necessary. And that's kind of the cool thing about this is that Suicide Run gives us an idea of what Dr. Octopus is going to do in the body of Peter Parker. And that was really what was necessary about this story, just because of the fact that when, you know, Dan Slott was kind of leading up to this whole Superior Spider-Man thing, that nobody really knew that it was coming. It was just Dan Slott kind of saying what he always does. Oh, this story is going to change things forever. And this story is going to change the landscape of the Spider-Man mythos and nothing's ever going to be the same. And it was cool to see it for what it was. I mean, it was interesting to kind of, you know, see how it all played out. But the very idea here was that we were basically going to see what we would, what direction the stories would end up going in. You know, of course, the idea that Dr. Octopus and Peter Parker have presumably switched bodies forever. And that was really the, the indication that was left here at the tail end of this story. Now, keep in mind, in the last video, we had talked about how with their bodies switched, the mind of Peter Parker was basically in the body of Dr. Octopus, who was moments away from from dying. I mean, he was just right around the corner from death, just knocking on his door. And so really, Doc Ock had just kind of considered himself home free. You know, we're going to go ahead and call him Superior Spider-Man to go ahead and keep the keep it easy to understand. But Superior Spider-Man had kind of considered himself home free, you know, in the idea that he was like, well, I mean, our bodies are swapped. The body of Dr. Octopus is going to die. Peter Parker is going to die inside that body. And that will be it. Not only that, Peter's biggest concern was that Superior Spider-Man would go around and basically start doing things like reforming a relationship with Mary Jane Watson. And that was kind of the crazy thing because fans thought that was going to happen. And in fact, we get that little bit of a teaser here. One of the first things we see is Superior Spider-Man spending time with Mary Jane and the idea that the two of them are basically going to get together, or at least it seems like it's going to happen. You know, she says, look, is this a date? The two of us being here together, is this what I think it is? And Peter, you know, uh, Superior Spider-Man's response is, yes, it's exactly what you think it is. We're getting back together. Now, from here, uh, Superior Spider-Man's basically alerted to the fact that Dr. Octopus has broken out of his cell. And that was really the huge thing because of course, Superior Spider-Man was always on the lookout to see whether or not Peter Parker was able to find a way to escape his confines. And that's exactly what happened. The issue with this is that, you know, the, the body of Dr. Octopus, again, was moments from dying. And so Peter Parker does exactly what he needs to do and basically just kind of jerks the body awake, uh, basically, you know, kind of bringing it back to life. But in this three minute period between the time that he dies and the time that he comes back, he basically ends up visiting his hometown. And what he ends up seeing are a lot of these individuals who had died. We end up seeing people like Gwen Stacy, Captain Stacy, the father of Gwen. We end up seeing these various individuals who have played significant roles in the life of Peter Parker, but all of whom have effectively passed on. No more so than that, than Uncle Ben. Now, this is one of the greatest moments in the entirety of, of the Spider-Man run. I always, at least I always considered it is. When you look at Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben is probably the most important character in the life of Peter Parker, despite the fact that he's dead. And the reason why is because when Peter first developed the powers of Spider-Man, when he was first bitten by a radioactive spider, he did what every teenager does. He got carried away. He made some foolish decisions. You know, he kind of let his powers get the better of him. He got revenge on, you know, bullies that were giving him a hard time. He did what any of us would have done. But in this path, he lost sight of the fact that his actions can also lead to inaction. If he doesn't act when he needs to, someone around him could basically lose their life. And that's what happened with Uncle Ben. And for years and years and years and years, Peter Parker was guilt ridden. He always sat around and said, if only I had done something, Uncle Ben would still have been alive. But because of this, this gives Peter this kind of last bit to, to basically 
say goodbye. This last little instance to more or less just kind of walk away, you know, to, to be told by his Uncle Ben, I'm as proud of you as I ever could be. You've become every ounce of the hero that I believe you that you could be. You've done proud. You've done me proud with your actions as a hero. And that's really what Peter needed. That was the motivation he needed to keep going on. So what this story does is it basically just kind of transitions to, you know, Peter in the body of Dr. Octopus making his escape to a to an underground hideout. But it's also this idea that they're initially caught up to by Carly. Now remember, Carly is the ex-girlfriend of Peter Parker, but works in the uh, works in, in the police department. And so the initial idea here for Peter is, hey, Carly knows who I am. Carly can help me solve this problem. Now, the, the issue with this, and this is where Dan Slott really begins to hit home with the idea of, of the, you know, the whole body swapping thing is that to Carly's eyes, this is Dr. Octopus. She doesn't see Peter Parker. She sees Doc Ock. She sees a bad guy. She sees a villain. Now, where Peter Parker tries to say, hey, look, I can prove that it's me. You and Mary Jane Watson are the only two people who know my identity. Carly just kind of blows it off and says, well, Dr. Octopus has figured out what's going on with Peter Parker and the fight ensues. Now, of course, she's incapacitated pretty quickly. Remember, Carly is just a regular human being, no extraordinary abilities or anything like that. But in light of this, Superior Spider-Man basically begins rounding up the friends and family of Peter Parker. And that's why this is cool is because under the guise of Spider-Man operating as Peter Parker, you know, Superior Spider-Man basically says, hey, look, we need to keep you guys safe, right? You know what I mean? Dr. Octopus has escaped from the raft. He's got moments left to live. He's one of Spider-Man's most formidable enemies. He knows that you guys associate with me. We need to find a way to keep you safe. And in the guise of keeping them safe, he basically turns them into hostages. And that's kind of the cool thing here is because now he has lives on his side. And that's one of the biggest weaknesses or even one of the biggest strengths of Peter Parker, depending on how you look at it, is that he will not kill unless he absolutely has to. That was one of the huge significant moments in the Renew Your Vows story during Secret Wars when he basically allowed Venom to die. In fact, he really kind of killed Venom by really doing nothing, by just kind of letting the symbiote burn alive, letting, you know, letting Venom uh, essentially die. His inaction just kind of allowed those events to happen. But in Peter Parker's mind, it was what needed to be done. It was basically saving his family. And so what ends up happening here is that when Peter and Superior Spider-Man come face to face, it's kind of a slight bit of an exchange here and there. Of course, Peter's basically in this bunker out in the middle of nowhere, you know, in this, this huge, you know, trash heap that, you know, of course, belonged to Dr. Octopus. But the idea here is Superior Spider-Man says, look, if you want to play that game, that's the game that we can play. You know, if you want to play this idea of, well, you know me and I know you, so on and so forth, the Superior Spider-Man basically gives the location of Dr. Octopus's hideout, sending them directly to Peter Parker. Now, to be honest with you guys, Superior Spider-Man's really terrified here. And the reason why is because Doc Ock has really had to admit on a multitude of occasions that Peter Parker is extremely intelligent, dare I say, as intelligent, if not more intelligent than Dr. Octopus. And because of this, what is up happening here is, you know, Superior Spider-Man's terrified of the idea that Peter will come back and reclaim his body. And so he's literally just throwing every single thing he can at him. Especially when you're Spider-Man, you can use the tools of the police on your side. You can use the Avengers on your side. You basically have every single hero at your disposal when you can go to them and say, Dr. Octopus is trying to kill my friends and family. You have to help me. They will go to the ends of the earth in order to make sure that Peter Parker and the ones that he loves are kept safe. Now, from here, this is when we get into Dan Slott really toying with the Spider-Man fan base when we have Mary Jane Watson going to meet with Superior Spider-Man again. Now, of course, this is really just kind of, you know, a couple of people bumping heads who are both extremely stubborn. Of course, you know, Mary Jane's like, look, I can keep hassling you or you can just come and answer the door. But when the two of them start talking, uh, what ends up happening is Mary Jane just confesses her love for Peter Parker. She says, look, I absolutely love you. Like, I don't know if we're ever going to be anything. I don't know if this is ever going anywhere. I don't know if we're fooling ourselves. Who cares? But I love you. And what ends up happening is the two of them share a kiss. Now, for those individuals who were reading Spider-Man and who had been around since the events of One More Day, it was almost like, oh my God, is it going to happen? It was that whole will they, won't they thing. Are they going to get together? Are they not going to get together? Is Dan Slott going to finally come around to bringing them back together? Now, of course, we know that's not the case. And in fact, Dan Slott said on Twitter repeatedly, he's never going to allow Mary Jane Watson, or he's never going, you're never, we're never going to see Mary Jane Watson and Peter Parker getting back together just strictly by editorial mandate. Marvel editorial does not want that to happen. Marvel does not want those two characters getting together. They want to leave the past in the past. Despite the fact that a lot of people really want to see it take place, apparently that's not going to happen at all. Instead, the closest we're ever going to see to Mary Jane Watson and Peter Parker being a couple again is in the ongoing Renew Your Vows story coming out of Marvel right now. But what ends up happening here is Dr. Octopus essentially traces down, you know, Superior Spider-Man. So because of the fact that Superior Spider-Man, when he took the different, you know, friends and family of, uh, of Peter Parker to keep them safe, he'd basically thrown them in a room in Avengers Mansion. But what ends up happening here 
here is a pretty straightforward fight. I mean, it's really just kind of Dan Slott wrapping up a lot of loose ends, but between Peter Parker and Dr. Octopus, this is a, this is an insane fight. It's, it's a fight in the extreme. And the reason why is because Peter's literally fighting for his life. If he ends up, uh, you know, losing this battle, he's going to lose his identity. Dr. Octopus will go forward in the body of Peter Parker, presumably forever. And there will be no way for Peter to regain his life. Everything he's been fighting for will have been lost. Now, the cool thing is that Peter is extremely intelligent and he always has a backup plan. In this instance, his backup plan was to grab one of those little Octobots that allowed the mind swapping process in the first place and reverse it on Doc Ock, meaning that, you know, this, this bot would allow them to switch their bodies back to the way they're supposed to be. The issue here is that again, Dr. Octopus is also extremely intelligent. And so because of that, he planned for this possible eventuality. And that's one of the reasons why Dr. Octopus is so formidable as a villain when it comes to battling Peter Parker. Dr. Octopus usually always plans two, three, four, five steps ahead. And so while I wouldn't go as far as to say that he always defeats Peter Parker, he would present a challenge for most anybody because he's considered so many different variables and taken almost all those variables into account. And so because of this, what ends up happening is that this bot cannot switch the bodies back. Peter Parker is effectively stuck in the body of Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus is in the body of Peter Parker. And this is when the story seriously begins to become something special. What ends up happening here is that Dr. Octopus is sort of forced to relive not only the great moments of, of Peter Parker's life, but the terrible moments of Peter Parker's life. He begins to really understand what it means to be Spider-Man. It's not just traipsing around, getting the girl, having a great time fighting on the Avengers. There's a lot of responsibility that goes into it because in Peter Parker's mind, every single time he went out into a battle, every time he went out into a fight, it was always fighting for the people that he cared about. It was fighting for his loved ones. It was fighting for his friends. It was fighting for his family. The responsibility that came along with those things. Dr. Octopus begins to realize the weight that is now on his shoulders. With Peter Parker effectively dying in the body of Dr. Octopus, Peter says, look, it's your responsibility now. You have that power. If you're going to become me, then you have to fight for the people who deserve help. You have to make sure that the friends and family that I know, you have to make sure that the people that I care about, the people that believe that you're me, that they are safe. And so what this does is it basically steps forward forward with this idea that, you know, Dr. Octopus in the body of Peter Parker is effectively going to leave his criminal life behind. He's essentially going to become a good guy. And that's what makes this so great is because this sets the stage for him turning over a new leaf. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people looked at Superior Spider-Man and said, it really is just a genuinely good story. In their minds, Peter Parker will always be Spider-Man. It'll always be Peter Parker. It'll always be a return to that familiarity, a return to that status quo. But when we get these small little stories, we get to see what it looks like when somebody else is in the body of Peter Parker. Is Dr. Octopus legitimately a better Spider-Man than Peter Parker is? Is he more intelligent? Is he more capable? Is he able to do greater things. And we'll see that happen. We'll see the formation of what will become Parker Industries going into all new Auto for Marvel. We will see, you know, the early formation of that company here in Superior Spider-Man. We'll see the introduction of Anna Marconi, an ongoing character in all new, all different amazing Spider-Man. We will see her in this story. A lot of the things that you guys are going to come and notice with regards to the whole all new, all different Spider-Man landscape, we're going to see a lot of those things growing here in Superior Spider-Man and then expanding outward from there, going into the main Spider-Man uh, Spider series as well as the eventual reboot with all new, all different Marvel. But again, this is really just kind of designed to, to show us what direction things are going to go in. And to be quite honest, I think Superior Spider-Man is probably one of the greatest Spider-Man stories ever told. I love the direction that it goes and I love the idea of Dr. Octopus trying to be a good guy using his intelligence as well as the fact that he's just kind of a jerk. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Core. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.